What's happening, everybody? Hello. Welcome back to the broadcast. How's there? I see there's some early birds today, <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty cool. Of course, us as usual, running right down to the wire, getting everything set up. Let us know any audio issues. We're working all the bugs out as you know our two-man crew here. But I think we got it. Looks good over there. Yep. Are you muted? Yep. Okay. Don't do what I did a couple weeks ago. I know some of you guys really like that feedback loop I created. And it was pretty impressive. <laughs> but I won't do that to your ears again. A couple things before we get to today. We're working on the acoustic shows with Matt Phillips from Silo Sound Labs, who is also in charge of making the new Trident plugins. We're going to be doing several things with them, some on the plugins, but we're working on an entire acoustic series. And I kind of want to know what you guys want to know or what your rooms are like, what your issues are, that sort of thing. We already have a bit of an outline going, but whatever, but I need some specifics from you guys. So please share any of that stuff. Go to the Facebook group. The link, I believe, is down in the description. It's private for all of us on the broadcast. We can share everything there because once the broadcast is over, it's a little hard to communicate via YouTube. So we, that's why I created the Facebook group. So go there, share any of that, any of your acoustic uh, questions, concerns, problems, whatever you have there. You got anything you want to add? No. I'm, I'm just no? Okay. overviewing everything Then here. we're, uh-oh. I'm gonna mess this thing up. As you can see in the picture in picture, I'm all ready to rock today. Steady hands. But first, I'm super excited to have Matt McGlynn joining us today. I've known him for a while. I got to use all his microphones. I've built a couple. Well, I've, technically I've built one, he built one for me. And now I'm building my second one, which will make it a couple. But I'm so excited that he's here because he knows so much about mics. He has a lot of great concepts on building a mic locker and he's gonna oversee my progress here. So let me pull him in and Matt, you there? Hey everybody, yeah, I'm here, can you hear how, me? How, yep, we hear you good. Right on. Thanks for joining us. I, uh, happy to be here. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw my face pop up in the picture in picture and it threw me off. <laughs> he's like, ooh, who's that good looking guy? <laughs> That's me, Not I'm my thought, here. But... <laughs> Well, man, thanks for joining us. Thanks for doing, you know, getting us this kit and the giveaway. Oh, that's, I need to say that, the giveaway. Matt has been super generous. We're going to give one of these mics away at the end of the broadcast. As of a minute or two ago, there should be a new post on the community tab of the YouTube channel that is how you enter to win this mic. All you have to go do is comment on said post with your YouTube handle. We have some old school pen and paper over there. We're going to write them down as we go. At the end, where I put it, we are going to draw the lucky winner out of this awesome Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs hat. Old school and pretty awesome. So that's on the so, community uh, tab. One, should be live now. <laughs> one comment about that. What we're giving away is the kit. Yes, not this mic. Yes, not the mic. So you get to build it too. Yes, and that's important, which is going to be great because you're going to get to see today. I am not a professional mic builder as Matt knows. So you're gonna to get to see that this actually is doable even if you've never done this before. The only one I've actually technically built and it worked the first time was this, I think this is the T47, right Matt? I believe so, yeah. And it sounds great. And from what Matt tells me, this build is actually more complicated than the one I'm getting ready to attempt today. So first off, you, do, you have three different things, Matt. You have recording hacks, you probably do more than this, but these are the three that I see all the time. You have microphone parts and you also have Roswell Pro Audio, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah busy times and it's all microphones all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, recording hacks, uh, people probably know about that. It's been around for 12 years or something. It's been a long time. And I have to admit, it's, uh, I, I don't have a lot of time to spend on it. In fact, I'm looking to hire an editor. So any of you out there who are interested in reading and writing about microphones and have, you know, some some skills with that sort of stuff, uh, reach out to me because I am hiring an editor for Recording Hacks. Ooh, there's a good opportunity. Um, so for those who don't know, uh, Recording Hacks, the, my elevator pitch for that is it's uh, Wikipedia for microphones. So it's basically a nerd's point of view on microphone history, 
where they came from, why they exist, and the, the descriptions that are in there are not reviews. They're intentionally not reviews. There are reviews on the site, but within the thing that's called the microphone database, the idea is really just to tell people what's in it and why, and what was the point of this microphone, because there really aren't a lot of uh, uh, objectively bad microphones, right? You know, most microphones are good at, at least something, and maybe it's a smaller set of things than some other microphone might be able to claim, but a lot of microphones are decent at something. And so the interesting thing isn't a good, better, best. The interesting thing is what was the design intent, right? Why did someone go out of their way to make this? Because it's not inexpensive to put something on the market. So there had to be a reason to do it. And sometimes the reason is because I want to sell a million microphones. Not, not the best reason, not my favorite reason. Um, ideally and theoretically, microphones should be designed to do something well. That's certainly my philosophy for the stuff that I make. So anyway, Recording X was about trying to tell that story times the, you know, 3,000 microphones that have ever been invented. Right. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a bigger job than, uh, uh, than I thought. <laughs> so, uh, well, I know and then, Ernesto uses it a lot. I mean, you research, because as you buy yes. new microphones, that's kind of where you yes. go get your baseline of info, right? Oh, yeah, recordinghacks.com, it's great. I mean, it's, there's so much info. Every model, discontinued model, it's, it's great. Jesus, pictures, uh, frequency graphs, beautiful. Yeah, the amount of detail, if you guys see me looking over this way all the time, it's because we have Matt on the screen to the right and his <laughs> camera in the front. But yeah, it's there, the amount of information that you have on that single website is kind of mind-boggling, really. It's so much. Yeah. Well, it was probably five years of full-time work. Um, Holy crap. So it was, it was a big investment. Wow. But it was, you know, it was a labor of love, right? There was, in fact, the first version of that website was designed, I mean, my, my hero, in a sense, was Consumer Reports. It was like, you know, I won't accept advertising and I, my opinions can't be bought. And, um, and then I was just working, you know, nights and weekends because I had a day job. I had to pay the rent like everybody else. Right. So it was all nights and weekends and, um, and uh, just a huge amount of time. And then after a couple of years, I was like, wow, it would be sure nice to, to get my, you know, my airfare to NAM and my hotel room paid for. In the sense, you know, can I sell some ads to pay for expenses? Because I was just, I was buying gear and reviewing it. And those, the reviews that I wrote, I mean, each one of those was like 40 hours of work. So it's just a crazy amount of time. I did it because I loved it and I still love it. Uh, but it was not sustainable over the super long time. Right. So that's why that site is not as fresh as I'd like it to be. But the plan is certainly to uh, resurrect it as soon as we can. Well, that's cool. I hope you do because we use it all the time. So yeah, they're still asking where's the giveaway link just Put your name, your YouTube handle in the community tab. Yeah, the, can you go to the front page of the Ultimate Studios, Inc., the YouTube channel. Just open a new tab. Don't let us go. And on the community tab, it should be the very first. Can you make double check that that? Mm -hmm. I scheduled it to go live at 6. Yeah, it's there. Yep. Yep. And we're going to keep checking that. We're going to write that down at the end. We're going to draw a name out of that the hat. Old school, baby. Okay, let's let's get into the the DIY. Let's just let's just jump right into the the hot topic today. Because as I've got everything set up here, which you guys can see in the GoPro, I went ahead and laid everything out ahead of time because I am going to attempt to do this in you know <laughs> inside the time of the broadcast. Uh, the instructions, Matt, the detail that you go in with the instructions on this are it's fantastic. You have color photos, you have soldering tips. And these, these photos yeah. are, I mean, some of these parts, man, even with my magnifying glasses, it's hard to see. And you have fantastically laid out photos and instructions here. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you why that is. see this um, here on the picture in picture a little bit. It's because I answer all the tech support email. So the better the book is, the fewer questions that come in and the better experience it is for everybody else. So, um, so the way this works is uh, when I release a new kit, uh, and, and people uh, build it early, I ask them for feedback and they say, hey, I had a question about you know, page 17 and I wasn't sure if it was supposed to be done this way or that way. And then I go to page 17 and I make that part more clear for the next printing. And for the first, you know, first couple of production runs, I'll print these uh, in very short runs and I'll revise every time. Oh, really? So I've already revised the one in your hand. I just did it uh, two days ago. And it's not a lot different. Uh, certainly nothing major has changed, but... Uh, so yeah, the, so the documentation, uh, it's as good as I know how to make it, and it does, it, but it does get better over time as well. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to understand, really easy to understand, actually. 
I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to start working on this as we're talking. So if I'm looking down, I'm not ignoring you at all. No, it's good. So so while you're working, um, give us a little I background say, on this stuff. Yeah, that's what I was going to do. Um, you can tell me. So anyway, first of all, <laughs> you know me. I talk a lot. Uh, well, so it makes you a good host. <laughs> that's one way to um, say it. I, uh, so, so, okay, so Mike Parts has been around, uh, I don't even remember, uh, eight, eight years, nine years, something like that. So anyway, uh, started out by selling just microphone capsules. And the idea of that was you can go to Musician's Friend or, or one of those uh, online retailers and you could buy a mic on their stupid deal of the day, you know, Guitar Center's website, stupid deal of the day, $49. And you could buy an MXL condenser mic for really cheap. And those mics aren't bad. They're, you know, certainly fine to start with. But most people, as they record more, they listen more, their ears develop, they realize that those mics aren't serving them. They're fine for $49, but you're probably not going to want to do a bunch of records with it. Now, again, I'm not trying to throw anything under the bus. You do what you're going to do, and that's all great. But most people, as their ears develop, they, they, they want to hear something else, something better, something different. So I would sell just the capsule that you could put in it. And that's how I started out, and it was strictly a sort of sideline hobby sort of thing. Didn't necessarily have ambitions for that to go to grander places. And then um, uh, MXL switched to surface mount. Uh, well, I guess the first step was we started selling circuit upgrade kits. So you'd buy that $49 microphone, and then you would desolder a bunch of parts and install replacements. Um, and then MXL switched to surface mount production, which is not something that's appropriate for DIY upgrades. So we uh, started making our own circuit boards. And the nice thing about that was that it's a better experience because desoldering kind of sucks. Oh. It's, uh, sometimes it's easy, but sometimes it just goes south. And I say that as someone who's desoldered many hundreds of components for that a whole variety of reasons. That is my least favorite put them in wrong. thing to do of yeah. any of this tech stuff is desoldering. Yeah, so I started with one of those spring-loaded I think it's called a solder pult, like catapult. It's a, a, solder, a spring loaded solder sucker. Those things are awful. Uh, I mean, they work That's what I for have. 20 bucks. They're cheap, <laughs> but they, 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 they're hard to use because when you press the trigger, uh, the whole thing jumps away from the thing you're trying to suck. And so they're not very effective. And then I bought one of the electric ones and that worked for a while, but those things clog really easy and have to be cleaned out almost every time you use them. Uh, and rebuilt every month or two. So that's really hard. And what I've settled on now is just a uh, solder wick, which is woven braided uh, copper, uh, copper tape, and it's uh, inexpensive. And if you get the one that has flux impregnated in it, it's just really effective. So you lay the tape on the joint, you put your iron on top, count to five, all the solder wicks away. Uh, that's great. So anyway, the deal with uh, microphone parts is we started making circuit boards, and that gave us the opportunity to put better parts in uh, and not being throttled by the, uh, the inexpensive mics existing layout, circuit board layout. Uh, and that comes to play in, for example, a tube microphone where you want a really nice big film capacitor for the output capacitor. And in the original, if you take the Apex 460, which is a common inexpensive tube microphone, there's really no room on there for a nice output capacitor. So when I made my version of a circuit to fit that that microphone. I started with an empty circuit board and laid that big capacitor right down the middle. And that way it's guaranteed to fit. It's the first thing on the board. And then I populate everything else around it. Um, so over time we've developed a whole bunch of kits. Uh, and this this one, the one that's, that Charlie's building is called the, the T25 microphone kit. So you can see that uh, my camera, my sexy blur effect is probably not gonna let you read that, but it's, it's called the T25 uh, microphone kit. And it's uh, the second kit that I've made that was designed to be really affordable. Um, it's We don't compromise parts in general because I'm just kind of allergic to that. Like I don't see the point of saving 10 cents on a cheaper resistor. I don't I don't know why anyone would do that. So the parts aren't compromised, but, uh, but this was intended to be uh, affordable and yet sound really good. Uh, so it's a transformer coupled circuit. And I'll, I'll also say that a really nice transformer FET mic is typically expensive. Um, there are some out there on the market, uh, but they tend to be, you know, $500 plus. Um, and this kit costs, uh, there's an introductory price right now, but the cost on this is going to be $249, uh, which is hopefully affordable for most people. 
Um, and the other benefit of this is that it's pretty easy to build. It has something like 14 or 15 components plus a transformer and a capsule. So, um, so like, you know, 40 solder joints and you're done. Um, we've had people build them in less than an hour. Um, and, no uh, and, and some people take a little longer, but <laughs> yeah. And, and no shame. I mean, uh, it, you know, I, honestly, I would rather people take a longer time, but read the directions. Um, my worst customers are the ones that, you know, like the grizzled old guys who grew up building Heath kits and they say, oh, I don't need the directions. Just show me the schematic. And then two hours later, they're like, oh, it doesn't work. I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah, read the directions. And we're not going to trust me. If this takes me longer, we're not waiting on me today. <laughs> I hope it won't. Hey, Matt, I have a question. The bias resistor yeah. that's from the JFET yeah. bag, is that the one that is, is that supposed to be a 3.5K? Whatever was written on the piece of paper in the bag. Where did I put that? Oh, 3.16. If, if you got two bias resistors, use the lower value one. Okay. Which is the one that was written on the piece of paper. All right. So I'll explain that briefly for those who are curious. There it is. Um, the JFET. So the, the JFET is the, it's a transistor, and it's the basically the first component that the audio signal sees when it comes off the capsule. Um, and to operate properly, it has to go through a process called biasing. Now, nothing changes about the JFET. Like we don't do surgery on the transistor itself. What actually happens there is that we're testing each one to find the ideal voltage setup so that it gives you maximum SPL with minimal distortion. So that involves plugging every JFET into a custom test jig that we have here, um, and we pass an audio signal into it, and then we plot the distortion characteristics on a distortion meter, and then we sweep the voltages to find the ideal bias point. And then we find the resistor that matches whatever that value that we've dialed up is. And in the cases where the uh, that particular transistor doesn't have a, a suitable bias point, we set it aside for something else. Um, so there's a selection process there too. But then once we've found that ideal bias resistor, we actually give you two resistors, the one that we've picked and then one that's a, a certain offset higher because the other kits that we make that use this same bias mechanism including the T47 that Charlie showed a couple of minutes ago, those kits have a, an option of using that higher value to achieve a specific other effect. That's not appropriate for this one. Uh, so this kit does come with a spare resistor that you can just ignore. And that's all covered in the documentation. Yeah, again, which is fantastic. Just trying to... One thing I notice about doing this too, and I remember this about doing the, the, uh, the T47, is, this is a bit different kind of soldering than uh, doing, say, snakes and mic cables, which I've done about 200 channels of in the last 10 days. Wow. And <laughs> yeah, a lot of rewiring <laughs> going here, a lot of new building going in. It's made nice. quite a difference, actually. But I, th this is a bit different, and I, I remember even with the T47, my first few solders not being, you know, the greatest, but as I kind of went on and started getting it down, they started getting a little better and a little bit better, which I'm sure with anything, the more you do it, the easier it gets. Do you recommend doing these these resistors, Matt, one at a time, solder in, then go to the next one? I don't. Or you get uh, them all in there reasons. and then flip it? Yeah, for two reasons. One, it's faster to insert them all, flip the board, and then solder them all. Secondly, if you insert them all at once, or you know, insert them all before soldering, and you get to the last one and it's the wrong value, then you can go back and say, okay, I put one of the wrong ones in somewhere. Let me fix that before I've soldered it down. Oh, that's a good point. So I am going to take that advice. So Matt, is, um, I, I don't know if you talked about that because I'm not busy writing your names down. But uh, yeah. is there a specifics in, in capsule design? Is there like a thing everybody goes after? Like, well, the Germans did this and then we kind of follow this or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so to talk about capsules, uh, I guess, you know, capsules are kind of a microcosm of the microphone market in general. Like mm -hmm. everybody wants a U87, a U47, yeah. a 251. 
uh, maybe a U67 if they get that far into their research. Um, there's, a there's a lot of choices out there. Those, Those are the best known. Um, what kills me is the most popular question I get via email is, you know, can I build a U87? Uh, and the answer is basically no, you know, for a lot of reasons. Um, there are things that call themselves U87 kits, but the circuit that's in that kit is the one that Neumann stopped making, you know, 20 years ago, and it has really low output as compared to modern microphones. And, um, but the other reason is, another one other reason is that uh, Neumann has a patent on the body and grill shape of that microphone, and so you can't create something that looks just like that. Um, and that matters. Um, so you can't literally clone that mic. But anyway, and the other thing that kills me is that uh, most people, the vast, vast majority of people who tell me they want to build a U87 have never used one. <laughs> so they don't even know why they want it. They want it because they've heard it was good. Right. They heard that yeah, someone yeah, else yeah. had one or something like that. Um, so, and I, I poll a lot of people who own them and the typical response is, yeah, I have one. It's a decent mic. There's other more interesting mics. Um, so, uh, and you know, I, I own one, I use it sometimes, um, don't love it on most things actually, but, um, you know, maybe that's just me. Um, uh, we have one here too, and it gets used, but not, um, a lot. Well, yeah, a lot of it is just also it's taste, you know, whatever it does to the vocals for the, for that song or for that singer. I think singers sure. have a huge factor, you know, in, in terms of how they work the mic and, you know, if their S's come through or too much or, you know, whatever, all these factors, it's, it's crazy. It's not just like one. So to talk about yeah. capsules, it's uh, what I was going to say is that just like people seem to have focused in on those couple of sort of yeah. uh, 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 classic totem pole, tent pole kind of microphones, mm -hmm. capsule design follows that same idea. So the uh, the Germans came up with the CK12, uh, which is a, a very complex capsule that was made by um, AKG. Yeah. Um, in fact, that capsule was so difficult to make that they stopped, and then they started uh, way back when the 414EB was still being made. They switched to a plastic snap-together version that's much simpler to make. Wow. So there's the CK12. There is the uh, K47. There is the K67. And before those was the M7. Um, the, uh, the M7 was a single backplate design, um, and the K47 was as well. The M7 was fiendishly difficult to make because, uh, the diaphragms are glued on. Uh, and so you'd, uh, the way it worked is that the, the capsule, if you're looking at the capsule as like a flat brass wafer around the circumference of it was a little lip or two actually that made a little trench between them and sometimes three to be pedantic, but whatever, there's a little trench. And then you poke holes in that through the diaphragm material and inject glue. Holy and if crap. you inject too much and it leaches into the center of the capsule, then you rip the whole thing off and oh, ultrasonic Lord. cleaning and start over. Wow. And if that mistake happens on the second side, then you rip off both diaphragms and, and re-lap and clean and start over. So uh, high failure rate in terms of the manufacturing process. And that's one of the reasons that Neumann developed the K67, which has two separate backplate halves. So you can do something that's really smart from a production standpoint, which is build them one half at a time, and then if they both work, match them and, and stick them together. Oh, um, well, yeah, sure. So, uh, so yeah, to, to answer the question, um, most modern capsule design absolutely follows in the footsteps of those for a couple of reasons. One, the designs are familiar. Their responses are familiar. People know how to handle them. Yeah. Um, they have some cachet, some name recognition. Um, they're not that difficult to make. Uh, I mean, it's not something you can DIY in your garage, but uh, in, in the sense that they're readily available, you know, they're not that difficult to make. So um, now that's not the only capsules in the world for sure. Um, uh, that probably explains the vast majority of large diaphragm capsules, but there are companies like Pearl and MyLab that make rectangular capsules. Uh, the, another company, Erlund, I think, they have a triangular one. Oh yeah. Um, David Bach. That. David Bach and um, George Cardis came up with the uh, the golden ratio elliptical capsule. Um, the Violet Design people, or JK, or I think those are all the same people. Um, they had the uh, the ear shaped one. Um, so there's, you know, and it, now despite the shape, those are still all pretty similar ideas, right? There's a, a piece of brass with 
some blind holes in it, which means holes that don't go all the way through, and some holes that do go all the way through. And it, and it may be built in one piece or two. Um, they have a diaphragm on both sides in most cases. Um, you know, so the, the concepts are the same, even if some of the implementation details are different. Um, and then there's companies like uh, Shure and Audio Technica who tend to roll their own in a broader sense. So a lot of the Shure, like the KSM44, that capsule is a completely different thing. It is edge terminated uh, for those that understand what that means, but they use like a whole plastic assembly around it. Um, and then Audio Technica makes a whole bunch of different electric capsules. An electric capsule is one that uh, does not need external polarization voltage, which gives you some shortcuts that you can take in the circuit. Um, you can subtract, you know, a whole, maybe a whole uh, oscillator or voltage multiplier, a bunch of uh, RC filters for noise reduction, that sort of thing. Um, their AT5040, which is a really nice microphone and it has crazy high output too. It has a, a two by two grid of rectangular electric diaphragms. So super weird, very interesting, and it sounds great. Wow. What, what makes a bigger difference on the sound? Is it the capsule or the circuit? What has a more profound effect on the overall sound of the microphone? Or is it not I really say one or the other? No, I would say capsule. Um, the, the case could be made that the circuit uh, has a bigger impact, but it, it's one of those things that depends on how far, how ridiculous you're going to get with it. You can certainly screw up a circuit to the point where it makes a really big difference in the sound of the microphone. But if you start with the assumption that you're trying to build something that works and sounds good, in general, the capsule determines the frequency response and the tone. Um, and, uh, and the circuit contributes things like sensitivity and noise and distortion. Okay. Um, the, what people mostly associate with microphones is the frequency response. So for example, if you were to take a typical inexpensive condenser mic, um, a typical MXL, CAD, Apex, Nady, Blue, Rode sort of thing, if you were to change the capsule, chances are nine out of 10 people would hear that difference. If you were to change the circuit, maybe one or two out of 10 would hear that difference. And the reason is that if you change the circuit, now unless the circuit's doing some crazy amount of EQ that suddenly goes away, then, but that's, that's unusual, right? Most microphones are relatively flat response in terms of the circuit. Uh, the U87 is a notable exception, but most microphone circuits are relatively flat in terms of frequency response. So if you swap one for another, the mic might have higher or lower sensitivity, might have more or less noise, might have more or less harmonic distortion, you know, evens or odds, good or bad. Um, but on a simple voice test, probably no one's going to hear that. Right. But if the frequency response suddenly changes, if you're suddenly, you know, plus five at 10 or, or at five dB or something or at 5K or something noticeable. like that, people are like, hey, wait a second. Now you sound richer or fuller or thinner or boxy or lispy or sibilant or right. Yeah, that makes total sense. So, it, so needless to say, a really good microphone design takes all that into account. Right. I mean, the job of the microphone designer is not to find the best capsule and then screw the circuit or vice versa. The, the point is to take a combination of things, a system of things that work together and complement each other so that what you end up with is something that sounds great and, and whatever you intended to end up with. Okay, so, and then if you wanna you know, go that far and build your own capsule, is there specific materials that are like kind of hard to get or is it all like pretty simple? Um, yeah, it's really simple. So you need uh, brass. You need a CNC, uh, you need a lapping device, uh, you need an ultrasonic cleaner, you need a vacuum chamber that does deposition of gold, you need gold, uh, you need very thin mylar, uh, you need some precision tap, uh, tapping tools. Um, I think that gets you most of the way there. I mean, you have that stuff at home, right, Ernesto? Oh, yeah, yeah sure. I mean, it's, you know, whenever I, I want to build mics, yeah, I have it all in a, in a drawer, <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so, but I mean, you know, getting yeah. all those tools, I mean, in terms of money, uh, well, what is that? Just get the tools to do that. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not feasible. I mean, yeah. you can buy a, a desktop CNC for a couple of grand. Yeah. Uh, cleaners, a thousand bucks. Um, the lapping system, you know, you can, you can cheap out on that, a piece of granite and a certain kind of lapping paper. 
Um, you need a jig for tensioning mylar, and there's some trade secrets around that. So you'd have to figure that out. Um, so no, it's it's not building capsules is not a DIY thing. Yeah, I think it can be done. Uh, you know, and I, the same question comes up with ribbon mics. A lot of people want to build their own ribbon, and I've seen all kinds of uh, attempts. Like you can buy a uh, what is it called? Is it a rack and pinion? There's like a flat, a flat thing with teeth on it, and then a wheel with teeth that match and mesh, right? So the idea is that you lay your ribbon on the flat thing, and then you roll the wheel over it, and it presses corrugations into your material. Um, and uh, and yeah, you can build a ribbon mic, but it it might work. It'll pass signal, but would you really want to use it? It's a science project, and and it, no offense to people who have done this and who think their mics are great. They might be. That's awesome. Um, but the people I know who make ribbon mics that I've heard and that have blown me away get these precision ground gear wheels that have a certain amount of force and they'll corrugate an eight inch length so that they can cut out the two and a half inch piece that's the straightest. Um, and they have special corrugation methods and different amounts of pressure and different kinds of corrugation based on what sound they're going for. So. You know, maybe it's just one of those things where if you're really into it, you take it to that next, next, next level, and that's why you get to charge $3,000 for your product. Of course. Maybe that's it. Um, but my impression is, uh, you know, like with capsules, you know, there are things that people can do easily at home. Populating a circuit board is easy to do at home. Rolling your own capacitors and transformers can be done at home. I don't recommend it. Building your own capsule and ribbon motor could be done at home if you're willing to invest, but... I really don't recommend it unless, unless that's what you want to do and you want to go into business. Because by the time you get good at it, you'll be, you know, a hundred pieces down the line. It's like that's all you're going to do. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's not a weekend. It's not a weekend project. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to yeah. wake up Sunday morning and build a transformer. Yeah, they're already asking in the chat if uh, when, when's the ribbon mic coming. Um, uh, I don't have a date. Ah, okay. We do have. Awesome. I, I have a really cool idea. There's other things in line ahead of it, which are also really cool. Um, but uh, yeah, I've been, uh, you know, one side effect of this pandemic is that I've really doubled down on R&D. Um, and so there's a bunch of stuff in the pipeline right now. But yeah, ribbon mic, I'd love to do a really great ribbon mic, but just so people understand, we had one before and it was not, you didn't have to corrugate the ribbon, you didn't have to tension the ribbon, which is another thing that you can figure out, but it's hard to do well. Um, what we had before was a, a ribbon motor that was done and you just install it. You literally screw it in, solder four wires, uh, and you were done because that's the only way to get what I would consider to be professional results. So this new product would follow in that mold where it's a finished piece that you assemble and a couple of solder points and you're done. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the whole point of the simplified DIY since like there's only so much that can go wrong, you know, uh, instead of uh, you going into the, you know, um, uh, sub millimeter work, you know, so. Um, right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that, that's cool. I'm glad I'm not having to do sub millimeter work right now. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, let's setup. see. I'm trying to see if there's like some question popping up here. Um, because, you know, everybody's just talking to each other and it's kind of hard to differentiate where's an exact question here. Uh, so I got a question on, let, let's talk about the topic, Matt, of building a mic locker. You know, say you're, yeah. you're let, let, let's start from someone's just has a few channels, has one or two mics looking to add the next sound and the next sound. What are your, you have a great philosophy on that in my opinion yeah can you share that thank you yeah um let me check in with you first how's the build going how far along are you i am i think i have two of the capacitor or resistors left to solder i'm just checking okay. i started getting better on my solder joints and then i just did a bad one i'm trying to fix well, it as long problem. as the as long as the part's in the right place, you can probably just reheat it and reflow it, and it'll be okay. Resistors are pretty robust. They don't uh, tend to melt. Let's see if I can get my helping hand going here, my homemade helping hand desk. Um, 
So I'll, for those who are interested in the, the build, um, I don't want here's to. a... Oh, let me try this. Let me uh, bear with me for just one moment here. I'm going to unblur. All right. So this is the bomb. Guys, I'm too scared to the, make the screen bigger on my soldering. For the T25. Because they say... So it's... <laughs> is it possible uh, one, two, three, to enlarge your both screen? I would rather be able to see that than two guys in chairs. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can make it a little bigger. Hold on. So there's seven resistors, a diode, four electrolytics, one other cap, and a transistor and a switch. That's basically the whole kit. So the first step, uh, we set this kit up to sort of be built by height. The idea there is you can install all the flat things, turn the board over and the, the gravity holds the board against the parts, and then you solder them down. I could use that right now. Gravity? <laughs> Something to help me hold this. My helping hand is not the greatest here. So I end up doing everything by hand. All right, you guys, we made it a little bigger for you. So Yeah, that's as, as comfortable as I am. <laughs> so <laughs> we're showing you guys my soldering skills here. Oh, you know what? I can share something else, too. Um, I haven't done the T25 yet, but just as the as the sort of California quarantine lockdown started, um, I started making tutorial videos. And so I got halfway through the S25, which is a more complicated circuit than this, but covers all of the same basic techniques, soldering, resistors, capacitors, etc. So if you go to the, the uh, mic parts, the microphone parts website, there is a videos page. Um, that shows step by step how to build well the, the first half of that S25 kit, and that is, you know, the camera's this far away from the top of the bench, HD, you know, well lit, hopefully, um, and I make mistakes because that's part of the deal. Um, so make mistakes and then fix them. But uh, that makes me feel better so, actually. So <laughs> for people who are hungry for a closer look, maybe that'll scratch that itch. But anyway, the, the mic locker idea. Um, so this is, uh, I, I put together a talk on this that I've given it a couple of different places. And there's, I think I did it with Warren. And uh, I think I did a version with uh, um, uh, someone else, I forget now. You did something with Ronan, uh, didn't Lidge. you? Um, I did it with Lidge Shaw on his show. I gave it in person at, at Ronan's retreat last May. Um, and then there's also excerpts on the, the Roswell YouTube channel. But the, anyway, the idea of this is that uh, it doesn't make any sense to buy a bunch of microphones or build microphones that all sound the same. Because um, when a, a certain source shows up in your studio, whether it's a guitar or a new singer or even a, a singer you know but singing in a new style, maybe louder or softer or whatever, you put up a microphone, you try it out. If it doesn't work, you want to have something that sounds different that you can reach for that's going to give you a different result. Um, so uh, the idea behind that is sonic diversity. And that is the driving philosophy behind the entire microphone parts product line and the entire Roswell product line. Um, and that answers the question Charlie asked me earlier, which is Roswell has four models of microphone on the market. Why those four? Um, and the idea is that uh, I'm trying to build stuff that gives you different sounding tools. Uh, Larry Valella of ADK has a great line. He says microphones are basically paintbrushes uh, or EQ devices is, is another metaphor. Um, you, uh, uh, you want microphones that sound different so you can be creative about the recording process. Um, and the way you can make microphones sound different is by using a different capsule and or using a different circuit. And again, capsule typically contributes frequency response um, and tone and the circuit contributes distortion characteristics uh, which is, you know, vibe and, and grit or, or lack thereof. You know, you can get that sort of that, I don't want to say clinical, but that sort of modern clean sound with really accurate transients. Or you can get that sort of vintage tube mic. A lot of people call it warmth, but more than, more than low mids being saturated, it's just overall saturation. It's a little bit of rounding of transients. Um, uh, and so that gives you a certain sonic character that you just you can't get without it. Like you can't make a microphone that has really low distortion sound like that because what you're missing is the distortion. So when you're building a mic locker, the idea is to have a variety of different things. 
Um, the story I tell in that talk that I really love, and apologies to those who I'm sure have heard me say it before, is I got an email from a guy a couple of years ago, and he wanted to impress me with the diversity of his mic locker. And he said, well, I've got this. And he listed six MXL microphones that were basically, I knew, all exactly the same thing. So they all had the exact same circuit in different shapes. And there were two different capsules. They had some small diaphragms and some large diaphragms. So he had six mics that were basically two mics. Um, and really none of them uh, were going to go the distance for him, right? Um, they, they all tend to be uh, a little noisy, a little distorted, but in a, in a bad way, um, and, and too bright, and or have frequency anomalies. Um, the capsule in his small diaphragm mics uh, typically has a dip of 3 to 5 dB around 8 or 9, and then a boost of 3 or 5 dB around, I think, 12, right? So if, when you look at the frequency graph, it's like a sine wave. It's, it's like the reverse of smooth. It's the opposite of smooth. Right. Uh, and that, that imposes limits. Like, you can't EQ that, really. No. It's just going to create weird sounds that you don't want to deal with. Uh, that's, that's something I, I find that happens a lot with the more the inexpensive mics. Not that they're not, again, not that you can't do things with them. I mean, for years, that's how we cut our teeth was with tons of cheap mics, and you kind of learn your, your way around the, their inefficiencies. But I find the top end to be... Uh, one of the big, most problematic, problematic areas with those inexpensive mics, especially with boosts in that eight to ten k area. Sometimes they're so big, yeah. yeah, and that's hard to deal with when you get you can you can only dip a certain amount of that out before you fundamentally change the tone in a way that gets kind of weird. I haven't noticed that with well the T forty seven, which I think is only like a three hundred fifty dollar kit, if I'm not mistaken, or right in that area, which is not expensive. The Mini K47, which is an inexpensive mic, and its you know counterpart, the the eighty the Mini K87, which is a very different microphone. But the the 47 has a, such a nice top end for cymbals and everything. But it is not hyped to me in that area. It's very smooth and actually pretty darn accurate. I find to where a lot of times I don't even need to add high end with that microphone. It just it somehow has the right amount. How do you yeah. get around that, but still have an affordable mic like that? Oh. <laughs> I mean, um, I don't know if that's an answerable question or not, but it seems it like is, there's some magic uh, going on. Yeah, well, there's, there's, there's some magic in the capsule um, and in the circuit. I, I'd like to think. I don't know. I mean, um, to me, it's not rocket science, but I've been doing this for a while. So, um, it's, uh, so I get that maybe it, it looks like a, a black box with a lot of complexity inside, but um, it's that mic is, is really great. It's it surprised me uh, the, the feedback I get about it early on, especially in terms of like drum recording, because um, that's not what I thought that mic would be. I thought that was the perfect singer songwriter mic, and we have gotten a lot of great feedback about the Mini K47 on acoustic guitar and on vocals. Um, but uh, people flip for it on guitar cab and drum overheads um, and drum room too which are not things I tried. I, I do have a guitar set up here now, but I didn't in those days. Um, so, uh, so anyway, in terms of uh, the mic locker question, sort of the next piece of that is, um, you know, if you, if you accept that what you're going for is sonic diversity, right? You want to have different colors, different paintbrushes, um, then you want to have a bunch of different kinds of microphones. And so there's three basic types, ribbons, dynamics, condensers. You want some of each. Um, Within Dynamics, there's a whole lot of choices and a lot of really fun microphones. Um, most people start with an SM57, which is a, a, a great mic to start with because you can record just about anything with it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and when you're adding other microphones to your collection, it doesn't mean you're going to stop using that one, right? For me, that's the hallmark of a really great, inexpensive mic is, I mean, you know, no one, most people aren't going to go out day one, you know, I'm going to build a home recording studio and they go to GC Pro and they lay down 10,000 bucks worth of gear on the counter. I guess that happens sometimes. I've never done it, <laughs> don't plan to do it. Um, so you, you start somewhere. You start with inexpensive stuff because that's what you have to do. Um, and the hallmark for me of a really great choice is something that you don't outgrow a few months later. Um, I haven't been blessed with that sort of foresight. I've got a bunch of doorstop mics that I started on. <laughs> that been so processed weird. through the shop. Um, Fortunately, I haven't thrown any away, so now I just make upgrade mod kits for them. <laughs> um, but uh, so anyway, dynamics, condensers, ribbons. Uh, th there's some dynamics that I really love. 
you know, SM7B from Shure, really hard to go wrong with that mic. The caution there is that it has the lowest output of, I think, any microphone on the market. Um, it has lower output than a lot of ribbon microphones, which is saying something. Um, so you kind of need to have a cloud lifter uh, to go with it or a preamp that has tons of really clean gain. Now, if you're recording snare drum, forget what I just said. The SM57 is fine with whatever preamp you have. What I mean is if you're trying to use the 57 on anything quieter than a trumpet bell or a snare drum. Or I'd like the SM7B, need... a lot of guys like that on screaming vocals as well because of that reason. Yeah, it'll take the level for sure. Um, the RE20 is nice. Uh, it's a bit unwieldy, but uh, it's it's predictable and it sounds good. Um, uh, I love the the Biodynamic M99. Uh, that's another another really nice dynamic. It's a little more hyped, well, a lot more hyped than the, the other ones I just mentioned. Um, I've always liked the uh, Electro Voice uh, ND468. They don't make it anymore, but they have a newer version. Um, ND68, maybe? I'm not sure what it's called, but the 468 had this little egg-shaped capsule on a yoke mount. Um, that's not intended to be a pun, but you can sort of rotate it and uh, you know, bring the mic up next to the drum shell and then sort of peek it over the top. And they sound great, too. Those are really nice. They're, they're nice on vocals, too. I prefer that on my voice to the 57. I think it's uh, a little more neutral. Um, what you'll find with dynamics in many cases is that uh, they sound best up close. They're kind of designed to be used up close to things. So um, so if you're trying to record something from a distance, like someone in the comments mentioned using a 57 on drum overheads, I've never tried that, but I, I think I'd hate it. Um, it's interesting. Part of the reason is that, uh, do you get any low end out of that? It's It's hard with the regular 57 to get the low end. We did, many years ago, I had a YouTube channel called Full On Drums, and we did a whole kit with, 57s only. Everything oh, cool. was. Overheads, room. But we ended up using a Beta 57 on the kick drum because it was the only one that had any actual low end that right. felt like a regular kick drum. So it's, well, what, I would say it's a vibe. Yeah. You know. <laughs> what I was going to say is it's a lot of, it's a lot of four and a half K as well. Yes. Um, what I was going to say, though, is that a lot of dynamic mics pretty, but I got it. sort of rely on proximity effect to get low end because they're designed to be used up close. So if you back off a couple of feet, then it, they just thin out really badly. Um, and that's where something like a, a condenser mic comes in. So like right now, um, I'm using a Mini K47 for, this, uh, for the audio for this broadcast. Um, I tested a bunch of microphones, including my RE20 and my, my M99, which is like a $500 dynamic mic that I love. I love it when it's here, um, but I didn't want to have this. I didn't want to eat the mic in the uh, on video. Right. Uh, for voiceover stuff, it's fine, but um, I wanted something that I could put at a little bit of a distance. Uh, and condenser mics just work better for that because they're designed. They're not designed to be used at an inch. Typically, they're designed to sound great at this sort of distance. And so, um, so you'll you know you'll want to have condensers in your collection. Um, and there's a lot of variety there. That's where you start getting into different capsules, different circuit topologies. Um, and, uh, and you want to have ribbon mics too. Um, those definitely have a, a particular sound. Um, I probably, I think most people would probably get a lot more mileage out of a couple of condensers before they start buying ribbons. Um, I do love ribbons. I've got some just out of frame here um, that I keep out. Um, so and there's a lot of great ribbon choices on the market for sure. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention about the mic locker topic is um, one of the handouts that I have, and, and people who haven't seen this and want it can contact me via email, um, and I'll send you a PDF. But uh, I put together a grid of um, uh, basically a, a condenser mic buyer's guide. Uh, that's stretching the idea a little bit, but the idea of this is uh, there's capsules in columns going across the top. So the, the large diaphragm capsule types are K47, K67, CK12, and M7. And then across the side are circuit topologies, uh, JFET transformerless. Uh, the most common example of that is the Sheps style design, JFET transformer, and then tube and transformer. There are other choices, um, but those are the ones that you, these are the, are the three that you most commonly see. But the idea of this chart is that these capsules all sound different and these circuits all sound different as well. So if all of your mics live right here, and you want something that sounds different, don't buy another mic that can be classified by this capsule type and this circuit type. Instead, buy something over here or 
anywhere else. And so the, the idea of this is that it's a worksheet uh, so that you can use a website like Recording Hacks to figure out what's in the mics you already own, fill this out with what you own, and then start shopping in other boxes. Um, so if you want that PDF, uh, let me know. You can reach me via email um, through the Roswell website or Microphone Parts website, and I'm happy to share that. Well, that's another thing I love about you is you're the tech support too, so you, I mean, which I'm sure sometimes doubles, triples, quadruples your workload. But if someone has a problem, they get to go right to you and get help, which I think is pretty freaking cool. Yeah. Especially this yeah, day and age. Um, uh, I think people appreciate that, that that's true. Um, it's not that much work, you know, on the DIY side, uh, the vast majority of customers complete their builds successfully without asking questions, which is great because I couldn't do this if that weren't the case. Um, sometimes people just, they go sideways, you know, they get in over their heads and a lot of people's first reach solution is, well, let me just, it didn't work. So let me resolder the entire thing. And I'm like, Oh God, you know, <laughs> heat will kill every component eventually. Right. So, um, and we've got pictures in the manual of good solder joints and bad solder joints. And so, you know, look at what you've got, compare and rework the ones that are broken, have divots, cracks, they're dull, et cetera. Anyway, so the tech support thing isn't too bad, but uh, I do try to be available because, uh, you know, I, I, one thing I love it. Um, this is, uh, uh, I didn't I didn't grow up realizing I wanted to do this, but I fell into it and it's been good. It's been really good. So I do enjoy it. I enjoy talking to people about the about the gear. So. That's all good. You know, on the topic, I wanted to mention of the uh, the voiceover thing. I've used the Delphos quite a bit for voiceover, and it's uh, I, I did a lot of um, we did some of the Portuguese overdub stuff for the Gears of War Five here because one of the main oh, cool. actors was here in L.A. And at first, it, it's a friend of mine that owns the studio in Sao Paulo that was doing it, and they saw you know, requested the U87 because that's what they used. And that's what I used on the first couple. Cause, okay, whatever. Use what they weren't familiar with. And then, like, I, I, we did probably 10 sessions. It was a lot. And, like, the third or fourth one, I decided, I'm going to switch this out and see if anybody notices. <laughs> and no one, no one noticed. They said, oh, man, this stuff sounds fantastic. We love it. Great. I was like, cool. I'm totally not using the Neumann anymore. <laughs> and... <laughs> And it sounded awesome. It was such a wonderful sound for voiceover. And we could have it a little further back, yeah. and it sounded like he was right there. The proximity was great on it. Yeah, it's got a little bit of reach. Yeah, that's a cool mic. Um, I'm glad it's working for you. It's, uh, we've, had, we've had good uh, success with that. There's a guy, uh, Andres Saavedra, who's uh, he's won a, several Grammy Awards, and he's produced a bunch of people, mostly Latin music. Um, and I guess six or seven months ago, he was uh, named the head of A&R for the Latin music division of Capital and or Universal. Um, I'm bad with names in that sense, so forgive me if some of those details are wrong, but uh, he carries that mic around with him. Oh, really? Uh, you know, he could use any mic he wants, but he literally carries the Delphos with him uh, from session to session. That's cool. So, wow. Yeah. I will say one thing on the soldering side, guys. I, my tip is a little larger. <laughs> I wish I had just one size smaller. I would highly recommend yeah, buying a, a couple and trying that out because, as, and I don't have another one here or I would go get it and change it right now. Uh, the only other one I have is a replacement for this one at the moment, so I'd be putting the same size. <laughs> but a size smaller would may, be making my life a lot easier with, these, with the tight solders. They're not pretty, yeah, but I suppose. think I'm going to be clean on them. You know what? My favorite tool. I don't know if you have one of these. Um, this this is my favorite tool. Uh, it's a magnifier with a little LED light on it. Yes, I gotta get one of those. I have one of these on my desk, one next to the soldering iron, and one in my kitchen. Well, that's because I'm old the, the... and I can't see shit anymore. So I I just about carry this with me. Uh, I'm not quite to that point yet, but I mean, those the resistor label values. I can't I can't see them. That's what this you know, light in I, front of me actually has. A, it's a magnifying glass as well which helps. Yeah. And then, but the one that off my helping hand, which never stays in the right place, you can, this thing is like, man, this is a telescope. I see the freaking <laughs> moon with this thing. So it helps, but yeah, uh, 
one size down on the tip of my soldering iron, would my life would be a lot easier right now. Yeah, we've got a page of tools on the Mike Parts website, and one of the things listed is a small tip for the for the soldering iron. Excuse me, um, a, a soldering iron with a variable temperature is really nice to have. Um, and then a, a smaller tip, like a little pointy tip, those are really helpful too. Yeah, if I do this again, I'm definitely going to do that first. Get a smaller tip, make sure I have that. Hold this sucker in there because these small ones would be a lot easier. All right, here are some of my specific questions. Good microphones to record flutes. Flutes? I don't know, Charlie, what do you use for flute? I've never recorded a flute. I've always used a condenser, actually. Usually, where do you position it? Because you don't want to get a bunch of wind blasting it. No, that's the tricky thing, because you have several places where the air or where the sound is coming from. Some of it's right around the blowhole, and then some of it's, you know, obviously along the the length of the instrument. So it's like finding having a room where you can have a little distance from it, you know, like say if I'm right here with it, if you can get a few feet, two feet, 16 inches, two feet away, helps mm -hmm. a lot in uh, kind of um, balancing the air to sound ratio. And then moving it around, your really good flute players are gonna have good control of their breath and the amount of air that's coming through. Some of your players that maybe aren't quite as good or uh, you know, haven't been playing as long, are going to have a lot more excess air coming out, but it's a tricky instrument to record. But I've always, I think I've always used condensers, and usually, at least 16 inches away. And then you, then at that point, it's have the player stand, right. and you just kind of moving it around, you know, because like yeah. a lot of those instruments, every one of those instruments is different. You get some that are really nice, and they're really easy to record, and you get some that are, you know, the cheaper ones that may not produce the same nice tone or consistent tone. I think the distance thing is actually really interesting. Um, I had a similar experience many years ago trying to record a hammer dulcimer. Oh, and yeah. uh, ultimately got good results, but it's it, if you get too close, you get so much resonance from the wood that it doesn't sound natural anymore. And if you're too far away, then you don't get enough of that. So there's a weird balance. Um, and I was trying to do it in stereo too, and I this was like the second thing I'd ever recorded, so I had no idea what I was doing. And... Um, uh, I set up a stereo pair and it sounded great in stereo. And then I put it in mono and I lost like 12 dB of signal. <laughs> <laughs> That's because not good. The, the two mics, they were perfectly out, or almost perfectly out of phase um, uh, with each other, with respect to each other. So, uh, so I could use one channel or the other, but not both. Well, that's also something is checking phase on any time you have multiple mics becomes so freaking important. Let's yeah. See. Yeah, but that's why I say the, the idea of backing off a little bit to give the sound a chance to develop in the room. I think that's a, a good technique in general. Uh, any recommendation on solder, specific solder? Ooh, yeah. Yeah, you know... I got that on flat. So here's an interesting story, or at least I think it's interesting. Um, I used to recommend 4% uh, silver from WBT which is a German company and they're distributed in the U S I think by Kimber. And, um, I, uh, uh, the reason I used that is because, uh, Jim Williams of audio upgrades had said, um, as I recall, he had said that he had set them up like a 10 foot length of each of a bunch of solders as a speaker cable and then listened to music being played through a bunch of solder and a speaker and that that sounded best like by a lot. So he loves that stuff. And wow, so interesting. I, so I tried that. And I used it for a long time. Um, and what I realized after trying some other solders is that it's just really difficult to use. It doesn't flow very well. It clumps. Um, and the lead-free version of that is very, very difficult to work with. Um, so what I use now is uh, it's a Kester solder. It's a rosin core. Um, it does rec It's not a no-clean. Um, so uh, we've developed a really cool cleaning technique which I have a video of on the Mike Parts website, but basically the cleaning technique is that you, you put on gloves, uh, you take a paper towel wad and you pour a little bit of 91 or 99% isopropyl alcohol on a wadded up or folded up paper towel. You hold the circuit board over a trash can and you scrub. And all of your little solder joints 
and the, the little ends of the components are like sandpaper, like super high grit sandpaper. So they shred the paper towel. But what's happening is all those little shredded bits of towel have flux and grossness on them that drop into the trash can. So you're scrubbing away your paper towel that's shredding into the trash can. And when, you, when the paper towel is done, your circuit board's clean. And then you sort of oh, wow. brush off the little paper fibers and it's, it's beautifully clean. What I used to do is I'd go out in the yard with a, an old toothbrush and spray flux cleaner, which succeeds only in smearing the stuff around the board. So you have to like douse it and let it drip and then scrub and then douse it and let it drip. So you're just hosing down your yard with alcohol. This uses a third of the solvent and a piece of, of napkin or paper towel and it works great. So anyway, uh, to not digress any further, um, it's a Kester rosin core solder. It's, it's a narrow gauge. Uh, and the specific link is on my website. Uh, there's a DIY tools page um, that uh, it lists uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, solder, the solder station that I use, the tip that I recommend, uh, the chemicals that I use, uh, and the solder. And in fact, I just added the lead-free version. So Kester has a lead-free version that's nice because it's less toxic. Um, and it's also a rosin core. The lead free version that I linked to, I believe is called a no clean. We clean it anyway. Um, the thing to be careful of with no clean with at least some no clean solders. And I'm not an expert on that, but this is something that Scott Hampton, uh, told me, um, cause he likes the no clean, but he said, uh, they're called no clean, but you have to rinse the board after you can just hold it under running water. Um, but the, the problem with the no clean, at least the one that he uses is that, the residue is conductive. So if you had a bunch of the, uh, the rosin residue on the board that bridged two joints, it would be sh a short circuit. Uh, so even though it's called no clean, what it really means is you don't need chemicals to clean it, I guess, uh, but you have to rinse it off. So um, now, again, I'm not an expert on that. What you need to do is read the directions uh, that came with your solder and see what they recommend. Um, but that's, that's been my experience. And, uh, and uh, yeah, you can find the links on the website there. I'm making my way a little bit. I got the, the, the pad switch on. <laughs> okay, so for those who were following the build, so step one. My solders are getting is, a little bit better. I See, I need to build these in twos because the first one's always going to half suck. And then the second mic away. will be fucking great. <laughs> <laughs> so step one is a single diode. Pretty easy. Step two is two, three, four, five. Six, uh, excuse me, six resistors. Oh, I need to pull that through. Step three is the switch. Um, so this mic has a pad switch that's inside the mic. Um, the pad switch does double duty. In fact, someone was trying to bust my chops about this. Uh, someone posted a review of this kit, um, and uh, and and his his criticism was, um, well, the circuit board could have used a few more holes because it's so much harder to solder the capsule wire to the JFET on this flying switch lead. And that I should have, you know, like implied that I shouldn't have cheaped out on circuit board holes as if there was a fee per hole or something uh, or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the actual explanation for that is um, that the capsule signal runs at screaming high impedance, gig ohm impedance. And so you need to insulate that from any possible leakage path. And so if you put that joint on the circuit board, yeah, it's easier to solder, but your mic is going to suck. And we don't want to build mics that suck. So the switch does double duty. So what happens is uh, the switch, the reason we chose this switch is that it has uh, two sets of switched leads. The, the bottom two um, go onto the circuit board and they are there for mechanical attachment only. The top two uh, hang in the air where they're insulated because air is a fantastic insulator as compared to, for example, a circuit board. And so the high impedance lead is formed in the air and that's called dead bug style because in the old days um, for this sort of connection, especially with a little uh, integrated circuit chip, you'd uh, the engineers would solder them upside down. So if you picture a little rectangular chip with four pins on each side, like a little computer chip, and then you lay it on its back with all the pins sticking up, it looks like a dead bug, you know, laying it on its back with its feet up in the air. And they'd form those joints in the air that way. Um, I've even seen old 
mics from Blue, I think, where they took a, a Wima box film capacitor, and they did. I guess and this is a pretty cool idea because one of the ways you can do this is use a switch like we've done, where the switch gives you something that's in the air that's connected electrically um, in an isolated way or insulated way that you can attach other things to. More commonly, what you do is you put a, a Teflon insulated terminal into the circuit board where the Teflon sleeve insulates the, the conductive terminal pin from the circuit board, and then you connect everything to that metal pin. But those cost like a dollar and a half. It's crazy for this tiny little piece of metal with a sleeve around it. So what Blue did, and again, I'm, I think it was Blue, they took a Wima box film cap, turned it upside down, and glued that down. So its legs are pointing up in the air, and then they formed the joints on that. I thought that's genius because they were going to use that capacitor anyway, and this way it does double duty as an insulated terminal as well. Um, so that's why the high impedance leads are formed in the air. Um, and here's a picture of that. So the next step that Charlie's going to do is to install that gig ohm resistor. Um, I have no idea if that's in focus. Uh, Which page are you on? Ernesto can. Oh, yeah. Here, uh, I'll, I'll pull it up here. Page 10. So anyway, it just shows the, the resistor being installed vertically with the uh, one of the leads intersecting with that switch pin. So that whole joint is formed in the air. And that's tricky. It's a little tricky. You've got to bend some pins. Um, you know, soldering stuff to a circuit board is really easy because for the most part, you lay it there, it stays there. You turn the board over, gravity holds the board against the stuff, against the components, and you solder and, and you're done. This kind of stuff is a little bit tricky, but um, you don't want to compromise this. Like this is one of those production shortcuts you don't want to make. You don't want to solder stuff to the circuit board because it's easier because, you know, this is harder for two minutes and then your mic sounds better forever. So, yeah, I remember this on the T47 being the trickiest part, but once you do it, I mean, it's not impossible. I mean, look, if no. I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> here's, a, here's a question Is there a kit based on the Neumann TLM 170R? No. Um, honestly, I didn't know that mic was popular enough to warrant someone making a kit <laughs> okay. about it. I'm not even familiar well, with that I mic. I don't know Holy either. Holy crap. So I will say this. Um, TLM stands for transformerless microphone, although in German. <laughs> um, the, uh, there are, um, there can certainly be, um, so let me, give, let me give you something that I think is true, and I'm willing to be wrong. So if someone wants to correct me, that's, that's totally good. Um, in my experience, uh, most transformerless circuits have certain characteristics in common. Um, they tend to be neutral. Uh, they tend to have good transient response. Um, so they tend to sound modern, if you like that word. Um, they tend not to be used to try to create color or character or vibe or mojo or any of those sorts of things. They're kind of the opposite of that. So I think you can probably get a very similar effect with a Shep style circuit, which is also transformerless. Now, again, if, if someone knows that this is not true, please let me know, because I'm spitballing here based on what I know about that circuit. Um, so if you wanted a TLM 170 sort of sound, I think you could probably use a Sheps sort of circuit um, and then find a capsule that gives you whatever response that microphone has, and you'd probably be pretty close to a TLM 170. What's now, to be Go ahead, pedantic sorry. about that, uh, in a microphone, basically everything matters. Um, so as an example, the, uh, the, having the right capsule helps a lot if you're trying to replicate a particular sound, but the height and shape of the mounting post matters. Um, the diameter of the mic body matters. The construction of the grill in terms of how many layers of mesh it is, how thick the wires are, uh, how big the holes are, the plating. Here's a funny story. Not really funny, more like somebody fucking shoot me. Um, I built a mic the other day um, <laughs> that uh, it, was a, it was a mini K47 KD. So the KD is a sort of a custom shop thing that we do. We take a mini K47 and we turn it into a kick drum mic. Um, and so uh, someone had ordered one of these and I basically had been building these as the orders come in. Um, so I built one up and you know, doing a bunch, and, I, and I, my problem is I'm a perfectionist, right? I should be just like producing these and move on with my life, but no, I sit there and I'll tweak it for an entire afternoon. Um, 
because That's I want everything to be you. just so. And, uh, so I built this thing and uh, I got it dialed in. I'm like, okay, beautiful, it's done. And then I, the KD version has a different body and a different grill. Um, and uh, so I put the body and the grill on. And then because every time we open the mic, we have to test it again because you never know. And I don't want to ship. I mean, the worst thing for a manufacturer is to ship something that doesn't work, that arrives dead or messed up or something like that. So every time we open the mic, we're like, all right, well, the cost of opening the mic is that we've got to go test it again. So I put the body on, go test it again, and the frequency response has completely changed. Wow. I mean, ma like massive roll off on the top, just like, what happened? Is my speaker dead? Because we've got a whole special calibrated sweep rig. So I go back and forth, change the amp. And that's not it. Change the speaker. That's not it. Recalibrate. That's not it. Uh, okay, well, it must be that new capacitor I thought was going to be magic. Maybe something happened there, and I changed those, and that's not it. Honest to God, I went through like four or five component changes. And then I'm, I'm just I'm banging my head against the wall, and I look at this grill, and I'm like, wait, what the hell? And I hold this grill up to the light, and I can't see through it. Because when it was painted or plated, they screwed it up. It just like it fell into the paint bucket or something. Oh. And half of the half of the pores were occluded. So instead of being metal mesh, it was like this, this it was it was closed. It was just like this closed, gross thing. And I'm like, oh my god, it was the it was the grill. So I change the grill, and the response comes right back, and the mic is perfect. Is there so, a specific anyway? Everything matters. Specific, Sorry? specific science in the mesh, or is it just? Um, well, yeah, it, you know, uh, like I said, the the kind of mesh matters, but in this particular case, it was just a defective yeah, one. Yeah. I, it never occurred to me. I mean, we we made hundreds of these things. Yeah. I picked the next one out of the bin. I installed it. I didn't think to QC it. I mean, I was going to sweep test it anyway. So uh, anyway, now I know. Now I now I hold them up to the light. I'm like, yep, that's a good one. <laughs> so 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 the mesh. I mean, in terms of you know how intertwined it is and is, is, does it affect uh, proximity and, and uh, high end? Um, does it affect proximity? I think it probably can. Yeah. Um, I think I, I, I can tell you a couple of things. Uh, the distance between the front of the capsule and the grill matters. Yeah. Whether that grill is angled or flat matters. The diameter of the grill matters. The height of the capsule, excuse me, the height of the capsule above the deck, as I mentioned, that matters. The number of layers of metal, uh, all of that stuff impacts the sound, just as it impacts the sound. Um, you know, if, if you, uh, like if, if I talk through my hands, I probably sound different right now than I do without my hands in the way, right? Because any kind of uh, object, any kind of mesh or, or material between a sound source and a transducer is, uh, unless it's designed to be acoustically transparent, is going to impact the sound. It's going yeah, to cause acoustic impedance and all kinds of other things. So, um, yeah, it so, becomes uh, a filter, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like putting a filter on a camera lens. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a very similar idea. Oh, man, so, so many elements. I'm onto the capacitors. Just make sure they're oriented right. Right. So this uh, microphone has... Four electrolytic capacitors. Here's a, a close-up picture. This is not a super interesting picture, but this shows you what he's working on. So those are Nishikon or Nichikon Muse uh, electrolytics. Really nice sounding electrolytic capacitor. Um, and there's four of them, and they're the same value, and they're all oriented the same way, which makes the mic easier to build. Um, because you can't mix them up. They're all the same. So... Here's a question. Any notes on capsule wear and tear? Any ways to maintain a microphone? Yeah. Um, here's what you shouldn't do. Don't try to clean it. Um, I've gotten some sad, sad emails from people over the years who say, well, I was cleaning my vintage U87, 67, 47, and all the gold came off. And I'm like, yeah, I bet. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Because gold doesn't stick very well to mylar. Um, and so from the perspective of your Q-tip, the gold coating is contamination. Oh. Um, so especially if you use some kind of solvent. So I've heard of people using 
distilled water. I don't recommend it because if water gets in the capsule, then you're screwed. I've heard of people using anhydrous alcohol, which I have. And in fact, I've been meaning to pull out a junk capsule and uh, and see if that takes the goal off. I guess it would because it's that stuff's pretty harsh. I've been disinfecting the shop with it. Um, so anyway, no, don't clean your capsule. Um, there are uh, vintage and cherished and revered microphones from the 1940s uh, that fetch command uh, prices of you know $15,000 and up that have never been cleaned. And furthermore, if you tried to clean them, they wouldn't be worth a fraction of what they used to be worth. So, um, you know, if those vintage U47s haven't had cleaned capsules and they've got you know 50 years of spit and smoke and food particles on them, then you know your road NT1 from four years ago is just fine. <laughs> And, and is, is there any dust buildup? I mean, that... There can be. Yeah. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, the weight, the weight of dust is irrelevant. Uh, the risk that could happen is um, some capsules... Let me uh, actually... Let me step away for five seconds, and that way I can have a visual aid. I'll be right back. I'm going to reiterate to everyone out there... My biggest mistake, I think, that's made it the hardest is this tip is just, it's slightly too big for this. So that would be the first thing whenever you get a soldering iron, get a couple different tips. This one's great for mic cables. I've been flying through all these snake rebuilds great. It is making some of these solders a bit tricky. And on top of that, I'm not the greatest at this anyway, and it's making, that makes it even harder. But definitely make sure you get a the right tip to make your life easier for this. So uh, here's what I wanted to show. So this is a, a mic capsule that's been passed around uh, when I guest lecture at various places. So it's gross and got fingerprints on it, but ignore that. What, what I wanted to show is that for some mic capsules, the metal, the metalized part is uh, on a ring set back from the edge of the capsule. So if you can see there's kind of a border around the gold part where you can see the back plate through. Um, now, if you get enough dust that it forms a, a, a conductive bridge that electrically connects that metalized area in the center of the capsule with the edge, then the capsule can short circuit because the screws around the periphery are, are screwed into the back plate. And in a typical condenser mic, the back plate is carrying a charge, say plus 60 volts, and the diaphragm is grounded. So there's a 60 volt difference there. And if you connect them, then it's a short circuit and you'll get no sound. Um, so uh, so that is that is the main condition in which dust or... Oh, I'm sorry. You guys can't hear me. Shit. The mic's over here. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. We, oh, yeah. we got you great. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, uh, that's the case that you have to watch out for. Is, that's a mini uh, K47, man. It's going to pick up everything. <laughs> um yeah, so just watch out for that. But otherwise, in general, just don't clean your capsule. It's it's probably going to cause more grief than good. Oh, that's ugly. That first one's ugly. It's ugly. It's ugly. It's really, really ugly. Let me fix that one. I'm trying to move through. Oh, this. here's a question. Is there anything you can add with a DUMIY sub kick besides just wiring an XLR to it? Oh, that's an interesting question. So a sub kick is when you take like an NS10 driver speaker and uh, and stick it up as a transducer in front of a kick drum. So that's a pretty popular trick. Uh, I've never tried it. Um, I uh, yeah, I have nothing to add. I mean, I, I guess theoretically you could um, you could build some kind of filter network if you wanted to uh, uh, and try to do some EQ in line. Um, probably more trouble than it's worth unless you know what you're doing. Yeah, I would say my personal opinion on that would be do that after the fact or if you have, you know, either plugins or board or something. Personally, I have a sub kick or I have my homemade one that works rather well. I find them in a lot of music to be a little bit too slow for me reacting to the kick drum. And a lot of the times I find that I like the low end from a condenser better. However, I will say the actual NS10 speaker, and I haven't used a brand new sub kick, but my buddy Scott has one with a real NS10. It's probably the best one of all. 
It's way better than hmm. mine. I think mine's a, I had a pair of Teledyne monitors or something like that I pulled the 8 out of. And the, the, the peak frequency is like 40 hertz or 42 hertz. It's, it's great for hip hop. Oh. But personally, I find that I like uh, condenser mics better for the low end. Matt, this is not pretty, but I hope it works. I'm getting better. I, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> if it doesn't, it's definitely my freaking fault, man. Holy crap. The big thing is the tip on the soldering iron. I didn't even, you know what? I, I should have prepped that a little bit more and, even, and thought about that. I just figured, man, I'm doing all the soldering lately, all these things. I got out, ah, this will be fine. Well, what did you use last time? Was it the same one? I can't remember, actually. I think I had a different soldering iron then when we did mm. that one, because that was a couple years ago now. But we're I getting think there. a narrower we're tip. We're getting there. Look at that. We make them progress. A narrower tip buys you a little bit more uh, leeway. It doesn't heat up quite as fast. So. But yeah, yeah so that's what I'm noticing with this. It gets, hot. It, it gets hot really quick when I put it close to that PCB. They ask, is that so, a Charlie, watt Weller? If you've got the electrolytics in, you could be just about done because the next step is the pad capacitor, which is a little tricky because um, it's one of those flying lead things, but you don't need it. Like if you don't want to, if you want to install the pad cap capacitor later, the mic will work fine without it. Nah, man, I'm in this for the long haul. I'm going all in. <laughs> We're, yeah, because we are. Like the next step is, I mean, so far capsule. as I look at where I'm at, I'm looking pretty good. I mean, some of my solders don't look pretty, but. Here's another question. Can you talk about the T12 um, and the resistor that you can swap out for harmonics? Yeah, so I mentioned this before. That, so the T12, the circuit in the T12 and in Charlie's T47 and in this new mic, the T25, is similar. So they're all based on the KM84. So the KM84 is a Neumann pencil mic that I have just out of reach. Um, beautiful, beautiful pencil condenser mic. Uh, I think it was the first phantom powered mic ever made. Um, and uh, the circuit is awesome. Um, I love the circuit because it's, um, here's a schematic and it, I'll mention this too. You don't need to be able to read a schematic to build these kits. Um, and in some of my kits, I don't even put the schematic in because they're just intimidating and you don't need it. Some people get, uh, you know, they, they want them because they figure like that's documentation that they need for maintenance. And that's fair. Um, but you don't need to read them. But uh, for those who can read it, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, and most of that is noise filters. So the actual audio signal path is uh, uh, from the capsule right here into the JFET right here. So it's direct coupled, no coupling cap, uh, into the output cap right here, and then into the transformer, and then out the XLR jack. So four parts. Um, and the rest is just setting up of voltages and, and filtering noise. Um, so uh, so the, the T25 is simpler than the T12 because the T25 doesn't need to power the capsule. The T12 needs, uh, uses a capsule that requires external voltage, and so um, as did the KM84. And so the T12 has a whole extra leg of the circuit uh, where it basically draws DC voltage um, off of uh, the, off of phantom power and then filters it a bunch of times and then sends it to the capsule. Um, but we don't need any of those components in this build because we have an electric capsule that doesn't need that. Um, uh, now in the, in this circuit in all flavors of this circuit, um, the, uh, the way I've designed it, the JFET and, uh, and the whole circuit will overload at moderate SPL. And, um, I did that cause it sounds good. Uh, Arguably, this is a design mistake, right? Because microphones aren't supposed to distort. Well, no. If it sounds good, it is good. Exactly. So, um, and if you if you read the reviews on the mic part side of the T12, they're really good. Um, that's the mic that you know Greg Wells is like. I can't believe this only costs 400 bucks. Um, so um, so anyway, the mic has has gotten a lot of uh, of good attention. Um, and so, uh, and the saturation characteristics are a big, big part of that. Um, and so, uh, when, so, and, and I'll, I'll take another quick digression, uh, because it illustrates some of my philosophy. So, um, years and years ago when I was doing recording hacks, a company sent me a, a mic or a mic pre or whatever it was. 
and it had a, a tube and a FET circuit. And the idea was you could dial back and forth. It wasn't like tube or FET. It was like a pot with 40 steps in between, or at least, at least 15, 20 steps in between. So not just one or the other, but you have all kinds of in-between flavors. Um, and I thought, man, this is going to be so great. And I set it all up, and I put it all the way on FET, and I'm like, blah, 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 and all the way on tube, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, shit, I can't, I can't hear any difference. Like, it was so subtle. Right. Um, so I thought, you know, not only do I not need the 15 steps in between, I'm not sure, sure I need the, the extremes. Like, I don't get it. And so when I, uh, when I design gear, I'd rather err on the side of being unsubtle. Um, I don't want people to buy the thing and be like, oh, this is disappointing. I thought it was going to be this thing. And it's just like, uh, you know, I don't want that meh reaction. Like, you may not love my stuff, but I don't want you to be bored by it. <laughs> Well, you know, that's so, one thing I love about the Colaris is the, how colored it is. So I went and had an 18 dB inline pad built so I could keep the color so I could push drums into it and get some of that overload and that color from not using the pad. Wow, okay. So I'm actually bringing the signal the coming pad. into it down or out of it down as opposed to turning the pad on and changing the circuit on the inside. And you get all those wonderful, right. beautiful harmonics that saturate and sounds cool. so, that's so cool. So, uh, okay, so to get back to the original question, um, uh, one of the ways you can manipulate uh, distortion in that design is JFET bias. And that's a discovery that I made. I've never seen anyone else talk about that, but um, maybe maybe it's out there, whatever. I don't claim to have invented it, but in this, in this case, it's something that we uh, came up with as we were biasing JFETs, and I was just trying to see, well, you know, where are the extremes oh, and what can we get away with? And so every for every JFET that we bias, uh, as I said before, we found out that there's a certain offset that gives us a certain effect within this circuit. Now, I don't know that this is universally true, uh, but within this circuit, there's a certain behavior that we can predict. And, um, and so when you build it, and this is another one of my philosophies, one of the reasons that you should build gear is because then you can personalize it. What that literally means is that you can make it the way you want it to sound or to look, okay? Um, there are other reasons to, for DIY, such as it costs less, and there's you know a lot of good reasons like that, but I try to build personalization options into the kits. Um, the tube mic that we do lets you pick from two different high-pass filter settings. You can have a rumble filter, or you can have something that you can hear, like a something that actually cuts out lows that you might, you know, like in the... 150 to 200 range, not just the 80 hertz range. So um, uh, in a lot of the kits, you know, someone asked about making a kick drum version of one of the kits. You can change pad capacitor values, for example. You can change capsule polarization voltage, right? So you have options um, within the build that let you personalize the mic. And so this JFET bias resistor is one of them. Um, so if you were building a character mic, um, if you said, you know what, I'm, I'm unlikely to ever want to record drums or high SPL sources. I'm just going to be doing uh, vocals, but I really want that rich, vintage, to be saturated. I mean, pick your word, right? I just want that character. Then you have the option of putting in this alternate bias resistor in the T12 or the T47. Um, and, uh, and that will kind of turn on this extra mojo. Um, and then if you don't like it, you switch it back. Um, of course, a lot of people ask, well, why didn't you put a switch in so I can switch the modes? And the answer is, well, A, you'll probably blow your JFET, and B, it's that's the wrong part of the circuit to be adding a lot of extra circuitry. Um, so, uh, so there were reasons to not do it. Plus, I, I don't know. I, I've i crossed the line for sure. I think internal switches are kind of lame. Yeah, I do it. Uh, but I, I still think it's kind of lame, and I try not to do it. Um, in, in this case of this mic, you know, we needed a way to lift those high impedance joints off the board and we can get a pad option basically for free. You know, the solution to one is the solution to the other. So we take the internal switch. Um, but I didn't want to add yet another switch to that other mic, which already has two. It's got a internal cardioid uh, omni pattern switch as well as the internal pad. And I was just like, ah, that's enough. So. Yeah, they were also asking, you know, certain places for resources if you want to start designing this thing, apart from, you know, having a degree in electronics, but I'm actually getting um, really close. Any, any places that, that you might recommend? 
for designing mic circuits or something like that. I'll be right I back. I would say I just, start, my lead just start doing in the back. You guys take over for a second. I got to grab those little lead wires. So, yeah. um, I would say just start doing it. Um, you know, the schematics of a lot of microphones have been published. There's a bunch linked on recording hacks. Oh, yeah. So you can you can build, uh, you know, a Cam 84. And, um, you know, that, that's a simpler one. That's a good one to start with because it's simpler. Um, you know, the transformer, get a good transformer. That does a lot of the work for you. Um, but uh, you could learn Spice. There's a, an app called Spice that lets you basically create circuit simulations and then turn them on and it, it will tell you what's happening with voltages and things like that. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of cool stuff to learn. Um, but there's no way, like I, I learn, I've been doing this for a while and I learn new stuff every second day. Um, it depends what questions you ask, of course, but, um, there's no substitute for building stuff. I just got, uh, three sets of new circuit boards from the fab today, just new prototype stuff that I'm working on. Um, I got two last week. I'm just, I'm cranking through new ideas and designs and, and you know, some of them fail. I've got, hell, I've got a shoebox full of reject projects. Um, but that's, that's how I've learned. Um, just do it, do it a bunch, uh, figure out how to measure, you know, see what matters, get an oscilloscope, learn how to use it, get a distortion meter. Um, it kills me when, um, companies make claims that they, and they don't do any testing. It's like, well, how do you know, you know, what, like what's in there? What is it? What, what did you change? That's creating this magical effect that you don't know how to test. <laughs> that kind of makes me crazy. All right. I'm onto the capsule. Uh, here. So there's another question, question that does the, the small, um, diaphragm condenser capsules work with an AKG P170? I don't think so. Uh, honest answer is I don't know. Um, yeah. So Mike Parts does make a really, really sweet small diaphragm capsule. Um, and we made them to fit the MXL bodies because the MXL bodies are ubiquitous. They're cheap, readily available. Um, and that's... Uh, at least in the U.S., that's kind of the go-to cheap donor mic. Um, when we started out, we were putting circuits in third-party mic bodies. Now we make our own stuff. Um, but we're a little bit stuck with some of those standards in terms of, you know, chassis sizes and shapes. Um, so for the small, so we make this really nice small diaphragm capsule that sweeps really, really close to the KM84. Um, and uh, um, if you've heard Charlie talk about that SDC84 snare mic, that's got that capsule on there. Um, the product page for those capsules lists the mics that we know that they fit. And if, if that list doesn't say Perception 170, and I'm almost certain it doesn't, then best case, we don't know, or we know that it doesn't. Um, there's no other secret list of compatibility that I've reserved for some reason. Um, so uh, if you want to buy one and it doesn't work, you can return it. Um, so, uh, but yes, but, but so there's, there's two or three things to watch for. One thing you can check right off the bat is check your outside diameter. My capsules are 22 millimeters. If your mic is different, then it for sure won't fit. Um, if your, uh, the, the terminal on my capsule protrudes a little bit, if your mic body has a terminal that protrudes way past the threads, then my capsule won't work because the terminals will, will run into each other before the threads mesh. Um, and then there's different thread pitches too. So yeah, that's what I know. Um, here's another one. Uh, mic and preamps typically voltage or current driven? I don't understand the question. Well, are, because I'm not, they, a, I'm not a preamp designer. I'm sorry. Well, but I mean, if, if, if you make mics that use, I mean, are they based on, 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 on voltages? Mics? Oh, I see how yeah, it's going on. Oh, do you need a high current? Yeah. Okay. So the short answer is most 
Condenser microphones are phantom powered. There is a phantom power standard, which has not much current at all, hey, and roughly 48 volts I'm in, Sorry, DC. I'm going to interrupt real quick. Just question. Hey, Matt, on these leads coming out of the, the capsule here, they're coming straight out, but I'm looking at the photo, and there's one of them that it's, it's like kind of bent in and up, and then the other one has it come straight out. Should I bend these a certain way to solder and then pull them straight again? What's the well, best way to do this? It doesn't matter, but don't pull on them because you don't want to break them off. Right. No, I mean, I just I like bend slightly them. bent the middle one just so I could solder it. Yeah, look at the photo on page uh, 16 or 17. Uh, kind of anything goes. Okay. I mean, it's, it's not super critical, but I, I would say don't, don't jerk them around. Not that you would, but don't, you know, pull or twist or whatever. I'm you right. can absolutely bend them to make them, like bend them away from the back of the capsule just so you can have room to get your soldering iron in there. Okay, cool. All right, sorry to interrupt. No, that's all right. Um, anyway, so so mic pre's provide phantom power. Um, I guess the the maybe more interesting answer to your question is you could certainly design a microphone, uh, and I've seen this done before. I don't remember the name of the company, and I don't think they're around anymore. But they had a solid state microphone with its own. I think they even said high current amplifier. So arguably, there are cool things you could do with that kind of system, um, you know, where you, where you have a circuit that has, that, that gives you some kind of sonic benefit based on a certain characteristic of its power supply. I think that's a really cool idea. Um, I think it's really esoteric. Uh, it also makes the product very expensive because the person has to buy not just the microphone, but then this proprietary power supply as well. Um, so I love the idea. On the other hand, it's not something I'm probably going to get to. I think the closest thing I would come to that would be a, a tube mic. Um, now, tube microphones do have their own power supply. Um, the ones we make operate at a B plus of 120 volts or so. Um, and then uh, uh, capsule voltage is derived from that inside the microphone. Um, so. Okay. Let's see. Just dropped a screw. Like an idiot. Oh, look at that right there. They're small. <laughs> Luckily, it fell straight down and didn't bounce. Okay. Oh, man, this is going to be fun. Oh, got... he says, what I meant by voltage or current driven is what are the standards set around? Is higher voltage or higher current either the gain of the preamp or the output of the mic a bigger goal? Um, I don't think either one of those is necessarily true. I mean, we have inherited standards developed in Germany um, around whenever time that the KM84 came out, which is when Phantom Power started becoming a thing. Um, and so weirdly, German broadcast law has influenced microphone design in a way far beyond what most people realize. Um, I don't think Phantom Power is necessarily the best way to solve this problem, but it's what we use. Um, so, uh, so for me, that's not a super interesting question because my job, uh, I mean, there's potentially an interesting job where you're designing, you know, a superior product that has this whole other solution. Um, and that's potentially a really cool idea for me right now. What I, what I get juiced by is the idea that I can make something that a lot of people can use that doesn't cost an arm and a leg. So for me, that means phantom power. Um, and so, uh, so that's what we use. You know, CAD used to have, uh, still makes uh, some really cool mics. They have a circuit called Equitech, um, and it was used in the M179 and some of the older mics. And it's got a bunch of op amps in it, and it drew a bunch of uh, current. And um, I remember hearing stories that if you were to plug in a bunch of these into certain preamps or power supplies, that they would basically overload the phantom power circuit, which didn't expect every mic to be pulling uh high amounts of power. Um, so, so yeah, there are certainly solid state circuits that can overload phantom, um, and they've even been produced. Um, but the designs that I tend to look at, and this is, you know, maybe this is a, a more basic answer than we want to hear, but, um, I've talked about sonic diversity. Um, hey Matt, is that okay? So, can you see that? Let me blow you up. Show me again. Can you see it there? 
I can't see that far, but uh, I'm looking in both cameras. Um, I, mean, I would say, do you have the red wire coming from the top? Yeah. How did that wire get so long? Is that like eight feet long? No, I just had I had I had it cut long. Oh, I um, I can spin. Okay. It should cut. You want it coming yeah. from the bottom, right? Ideally, yeah. Just very gently rotate the capsule inside its housing, without pushing your finger through the diaphragm. To try to make it look like the picture in the manual. Um, anyway, in terms of uh, mic design, um, I'm going for effects, and there's you know there's different ways to to get certain okay. acoustic effects, um, and I've found circuits that give me the different flavors that I'm looking for. Uh, I'm definitely experimenting with alternatives, um, especially when you get into special applications. Um, we're experimenting, experimenting with some alternative circuit designs that just have different characteristics. Um, so, uh, so there are a lot of choices there, but, uh, um, yeah, I guess it kind of depends what you're going for. That'll help answer the question of how you want to get there. Uh, here's another one. What does that di from size do for Mike's performance? Ooh, I'd love to know that. Uh, sorry, say it again. What does diaphragm size do for a mic's performance? Um, a couple different things. I just see Mike Morgan posted, Matt, the T25 isn't a large diaphragm condenser mic. It's yep. true. If I, said the, if I said the T25 was large diaphragm, it's not. The T12 is large diaphragm. Is the Mini K47 on which you're speaking? Uh, this is the Mini K47, and that is absolutely a large diaphragm, 34 millimeters. What does diaphragm size do for a mic's performance? Okay, so there isn't a better or worse thing here. Everything in audio is about trade-offs. Um, as as nice capsules get bigger, um, n so noise is inversely proportional to size. So uh, the larger the diaphragm or the capsule, the lower noise it has the ability to be, um, which is why if you look at a company like um, Earthworks, Earthworks is a great company, make a lot of cool microphones in the U.S., um, and a lot of them are, are somewhat pricey, you know, thousand dollar kinds of, they, they look like measurement mics, right? They're the long skinny chrome tubes and they taper to a point and the capsule for the Omnis is, I want to say, I think it's six, six millimeters. This isn't... Uh, and then the, for the cardioids, it's 10 millimeters, right? But those are all really small and those mics have fairly high noise floors, um, you know, 12, 14, 16, 18 decibels on the A scale of noise, which for a thousand dollar mic seems kind of high. Uh, but, and it's not to, not to criticize those mics because they're great for certain things. Um, the point is that you can't get away from the noise factor. So if you have a really small diaphragm, uh, you'll have a higher noise floor. So that's one effect. Um, smaller capsules tend to have uh, better um, pattern control. Um, not necessarily universally true, but a, a small diaphragm mic often has a, a more true cardioid pattern. Um, large diaphragm capsules are, are kind of a cheat. So this is a particular kind of capsule design that's really two parts back to back and they're identical. Um, and the way that you get cardioid out of one side is that sound goes around into the back and cancels out. But the back is active too, at least in, in certain topologies. Um, and so... Um, so you can get issues like uh, mics that become more omnidirectional at lower frequencies. Um, not necessarily a bad thing, but it's, it's an effect of the design of the capsule. So Matt, at this point, I'm soldering the, the hot wire from the capser, capser, capsule <laughs> to... Um, this is this is that my my messy one where you've got the one lead from the switch. Yep. Plus the the yeah. If you can wedge the bare tip of that wire, the one that comes from the center terminal of the capsule, mm -hmm. is probably red. Yep. If you can wedge that into that three-way joint, because you've got the the JFET lead, you've got the one gigabyte uh, gigabyte Jesus, one gig ohm resistor lead. Uh, and then, uh, so switch JFET and resistor. So you have those three things all already coming together in a, in a sort of cross. If you can 
wedge or pinch the uh, uh, the capsule lead into that sort of okay. nest to, in a way that it stays in place. So when you, so the worst is when you touch your soldering iron to it and it goes bing and it pops free. It's really frustrating. <laughs> um, yeah. Ask me how I know that that happens. It happened to me yesterday, <laughs> and I and I know better. Okay, I'm gonna see how. It's a I nice can... sound. Bing. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to cut this. Man, I'm getting close. <laughs> yeah, very true. Everything in engineering is about trade offs. <laughs> Laugh out loud. Yep. yep. Yeah, no. So the kidding. dead, the dead AKG C451, I don't have any kits for that. You know, the challenge with making kits is that it's really expensive to make to get any product to market. And, and, you know, my ramp for getting a mic parts product to market is a lot faster and a lot easier than even we do with Roswell. Um, and yet, uh, if we were to do a bunch of one-offs, I'd be out of business. Like, you, you know, I can't make one of something um, because the cost of that first one is a couple of thousand dollars. So I can only afford to make things that I think are gonna sell. And the 451 is something I get asked about every year or so. Um, so I'd probably sell a handful every year and it's just not, I can't, I can't cover the mortgage on that sort of thing. Um, it would be fun, but, uh, the market for that is too small. And that, you know, the general answer there is, uh, that, that happens a lot. I mean, there's, I, I get asked about this every day. Do you have a kit for this mic or that mic? Someone asked about an AT 3035 today, not the 2035, but the 3035, which I, I am pretty sure hasn't been made in a long time. Um, and it's really cool inside. And I was sitting there, he sent me a photo, and I'm thinking, thinking oh, well, I could, it could, you know, modern manufacturing going what it is, I could, I could mock up a circuit board uh, in a couple of hours and shoot it off and, and get three back in the mail in two weeks for a low cost. I mean, my time is, is the bigger cost there, but so that, and that's fun, it's awesome. But, you know, to get from there to this and, you know, a run of 500 circuit boards and picking all the parts and building all the kits. I mean, that's where the, the bigger spend comes in. So it's uh, unfortunately not something we can do uh, 500 different versions of. So which one is your, your best seller right now? Um, on the mic parts side, uh, it varies. And it's, it's kind of interesting because we have kits that we'll sell none of for two weeks and then we'll sell like four of them in, in a morning. And I always figure, well, someone must have posted something about it somewhere, and then <laughs> some people saw it. And um, like we we have a we have an amazing kit for the Studio Projects C1 and C3, and the kit's like sixty nine dollars. Um, those mics are hard to find now. They used to be pretty widely available on eBay, and now they come up, you know, maybe one a week. Um, I don't watch it that closely anymore, but the uh, the kit creates. Uh, it basically replaces the signal capacitors and then introduces an RC filter. So it gives you a, um, a sort of treble control, an adjustable uh, low pass filter in a sense, um, because those mics are, are great. They're really robust, but they're way too bright for most things. I mean, if you love it, that's awesome. Um, for me, it's way too bright. Um, and so what this filter, what this mod kit does is it gives you a better low end, higher sensitivity without increasing noise. And then most importantly, it rewrites the top end of the frequency curve from, you know, 5K and up. Um, so it's a first order filter that it doesn't do much at five or six or seven or 8K, but by the time you get to eight, nine, 10K, it's it's taking a bite out and you can adjust how much that is and you have some adjustment over the slope of it. Um, and that's been uh, a consistent seller in the big picture, but at the same time, you know, we'll go a couple of weeks without selling any, then we'll sell 10 in a couple of days. So um, so it varies is, is the two word answer to that thousand word diatribe. Uh, for vocals, the most popular mic is the T12, because um, that mic is just awesome and there really isn't anything else like it on the market. Um, a lot of people ask me, well, what's it modeled after? Because in their minds, every mic has to be a U47, U67, U87, C12, 251, RCA 77, I guess. Um, and it's unfortunately none of those things. Uh, it's something else. Um, what it is, is a really, really solid transformer coupled large diaphragm FET condenser 
that sounds great and it's killer on vocals and vocals love transformers and it's got a really nice custom wound transformer in it hand-picked jfet hand biased a couple of build time options that i talked about before in terms of saturation and and stuff like that and um seven minutes sounds really great um the best selling all-purpose mic kind of do everything do anything is probably the s87 um very neutral very clean uh, it is not a U87 clone or copy, doesn't pretend to be, doesn't want to be. I think it's better. Your mileage may vary. If you put it up against a, a brand new U87, the kit mic has higher output, more air, better low end, lower distortion, lower noise. It doesn't have figure eight. It doesn't have a high pass filter, uh, but it costs a tenth as much. So the kit's like 360. So a ninth as much. Um, the the three pattern mics we had for a while, then we were sold out for a while, then we had we got them back a few months ago. So the three pattern mics are enjoying a burst in sales due to the pandemic. People are at home building stuff, which is nice to see because I get to hear the music that they make after. Um, so the those are the those are called the S3 series. So it's a Sheps ish circuit with a whole bunch of changes and three polar patterns, and it's a a 60 millimeter body, so it's a little shorter, a little fatter. A uh, three-way pattern switch and a pad. Those are pretty cool. Um, small diaphragm mics aren't selling at all right now. We just got in the metalwork for those, and it's awesome. Um, it's brass, not aluminum. Um, so it weighs three times as much as the old one, which is not to say that it's heavy. You're not going to be curling these, but you know it's 54 grams for the body instead of 18. So it's just it's got a little bit of more heft to them. Um, we made logo badges so they look nicer. Um, the finish exactly matches the capsules, which didn't used to be true. Uh, we've improved the body to XLR fit. Um, the old ones were made at a certain factory whose name I can't tell you, but its initials are MXL. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the uh, the screw holes just didn't line up with the uh, in the body didn't line up with where the screws were. And so when you put it together, it was always off just like this. And it, I hated it, but that's, you know, that's what we got. So, um, that's better now. Um, anyway, we're missing a couple of pieces, but the small diaphragm mics will go back, uh, on the site, uh, soon. It's going to be a busy weekend, but maybe, maybe next week. Um, I absolutely be... love that SDC 84, the highest cool. yeah. edition. I mean, love it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fun one. We took so we have so the STC eighty four is kind of my version of the KM eighty four, and it's again not really a clone. We definitely use the same circuit. Uh, we changed the circuit in ways that make it better. The original had a ten decibel pad built in, like hardwired pad that we took out. Because uh, why would you want that? Um, I mean, one answer is if you want to put it on a snare drum, which is fine. So we ended up making a snare mic that's that's separate. But um, yeah, really cool mic. Uh, sounds great. Sweeps very, very close to a, uh, the vintage mic. In fact, I've got the sweep on the website. And then for the snare mic, we made some circuit changes to buy it some more headroom, and we put a different transformer in it too, a higher ratio transformer, uh, to buy it a little more of that compression effect. So And it does um, a wonderful job at that. It's the yeah, first it's cool. mic that I've had on a snare that I finally helps me capture the actual size of the drum, which is without having to EQ, actually. And I, Very cool. and I love that. That was, you know, I'd commonly use two mics and I had a 451 on for years and it was cool and everything. But, you know, I put a big Black Beauty or one of the other bigger drums up and I still never was feeling like I was getting what the drum was. And I remember it was Hal and I here when you sent that, that first prototype yeah. to check out and we put it up and we just looked at each other and went, holy crap, this is great. <laughs> And that's awesome. It's been on my drum ever since it's been the snare mic. I'd put a pair of the the non high SPL version, which is called the SDC84, up as drum overheads. And the cool thing about that mic is that the capsules are detachable, right? It's a small diaphragm, you can unscrew the capsule. And so I built a pair of my Sheps style STC mics and a pair of my Neumann style STC mics, and I used the same capsules. So I just swapped out the head amp. And I recorded myself playing a thing, and then I swapped out the head amps and recorded myself playing as near as I could to the exact same thing. 
And then I lined up the tracks and I was listening back and forth and they didn't sound very different. But what I did notice was, because the frequency response again comes from the capsule, which in this case was the same. The capsules were identical. Um, so uh, what I did notice though, was that the STC-84 had the transients, the snare transients were like eight to 10 decibels lower. So the Sheps style mic has really accurate transient response and really fast transient response, um, which is great for some things. It, and it's not even a bad thing for drums. It is what it is. But what I noticed was that when I put the Sheps track through, and again, I use Sheps in the descriptive sense, not the literal sense. Uh, when I put that track through a compressor and gave it enough compression to knock those peaks down by 10 decibels, you could hear it. Like I was having a really hard time getting 10 decibels of transparent compression out of a plug-in or a hardware device, whereas the microphone was giving me that for free and you couldn't hear it at all. And it was really cool because when you're mixing that track, it's like, okay, I don't have, I've got like eight decibels less of transient that I have to try to control. Again, maybe you don't want that in every case, but it's a pretty cool tool to have in your toolkit, I think. I'm going to make one comment as I'm actually getting ready to wire up the X. So we're going to do the giveaway here in a minute. I'm not going to make you guys wait. We're at 8 o'clock. Matt, I appreciate your time. <laughs> Has it been two hours of me yammering? Oh, my God. I've learned a lot, Sorry. so I'm not complaining. But I don't want to hold everybody up, even though I'm close. I'll tell you what, I'll do a separate video of this thing, record some drums with it. This is 84? Yeah, the, what Joshua was talking about was the SDC 84 high SPL. I'm going to add one thing on an earlier comment when you guys were talking about the difference of uh, large and small diaphragm. Uh, the, and you brought up the Mini K. One thing I'll note that I've noticed about that mic is it is a large diaphragm that has transient response like a small diaphragm, meaning it's fast, which is why I think I love it on drums so much but it's also has some of that fullness that I expect to hear from a large diaphragm, some of that roundness. Whereas, you know, like a Delphos or even some of the Audio Technicas that I use, the large diaphragms always have that kind of smoothed out sound. The Mini K gets in between and it gives you this nice punchy drum sound that still has some size to it, which is why I'm not a huge fan of large or small diaphragms on overheads. I get the transient response, articulation, all that stuff. But they always sound make the drums sound tiny to me. But the Mini K, I get that you know punchy transient thing still with some body to it. And I don't know wow. if that has anything to do with how you made it, but that is that's one reason why it has lived on my overheads so much since I got those microphones. Is it just does it that better than anything else that I currently have? Is there cool. a way to purchase a matched pair of T12 kits? Yeah, I actually I just thought I was. Oh, it overflowed. Um, yes. Uh, give me a second. I'll paste the URL. Short answer. Yes. Um, you can buy matched kits or matched mics. We do build all the kits. We can build all the kits for people who don't want to DIY. Um, I love DIY, but I get that not everybody wants to solder stuff together. And if your only goal in DIY is to save a, a dollar, please don't. Because by the time you've bought the tools, um, you have saved money to just buy the mic. So DIY only makes sense if you want to do it, if you enjoy the process. Uh, the side effect of that too is, and I, believe me, I've, had, I've gotten these emails and they're sad. These are my least favorite emails besides that U87 question I talked about. <laughs> uh, uh, people who are just trying to save money and they do DIY just to save money, they rush through the kit, they don't have the patience for it and they bungle it because it's a little tricky. I mean, these aren't, we make them as easy as we can make them, but face it, the parts are small. Um, you need a magnifying glass to read them if you're any age over like 25. Um, <laughs> As I look into my magnifying glass. There's there's some tricky stuff to it. Now, the rewards are great. Um, the personalization, uh, the I built it myself, and that's awesome. I mean, you, you really appreciate the gear. You know what goes into it. Um, there's all kinds of reasons to do it, but there's a bunch of reasons not to do it. And money is, is if that's your, your only reason to do it, then that's not a good reason. So, um, so anyway, yes, we build the kits. If you want, uh, you can buy matched kits. You can buy matched mics. And I'm about to paste uh, the URL in to the thing. So on the website, there's a, a, a matching kit fee, a microphone kit matching fee. That's a, an item on the website that basically buys the upgrade to matched capsules. 
So in general, between any two microphones that are the same, the least matched component in a general sense is the capsule, um, uh, especially within a transformerless FET design. If you get into a tube mic, you might get some mismatch between tubes and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, so if you can match the capsules, that gets you uh, 90, 95% of the way there. Um, and especially again with the transformerless FET mics, they'll be dead matched for sure. And I've swept them and I can see the two lines overlay one another um, if the capsules are matched. For the T12, they'll be very, very, very close. Uh, th there might be a, 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 a very slight difference in sensitivity, um, but there is unlikely to be any difference in frequency response. Um, and I don't think you'd, I certainly don't think you'd hear it. I think they'd be, you know, 98% matched. So just to be, and I'm, again, I'm being super pedantic because I'm an engineer and I don't want to say generalized stuff that some other engineer is going to crucify me for. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys, it's 8.03. Anybody who's watching right now wants to enter, you've got, oh wait, it just turned 8.04. So I'm going to say at 8.06. We're cutting off, so you got <laughs> 120 seconds to go get your name on that post on the community chat. So go to the, if you don't know where it is, go to the front page of the Ultimate Studios, Inc. YouTube page. Go to the community tab, and the very top comment that I have there is how you enter. Just put your YouTube handle in there, and we'll add you to the world champion, Super Bowl champion, Kansas City <laughs> Chiefs hat. Of course... I've had this hat for 10 years. They pretty much sucked when I got that hat. <laughs> I'm not going to wait. I'll make another video with this mic done. I'm not going to put everybody through waiting on me. I want, I want this to be right. I do not want to hurry this last part. And my sausage thumbs are having a hard time. So Alex Holness asked, is there a perspective that isn't covered in your T25 reviews so far? Uh, I guess I don't know what that means. Perspective. Is that like uh, what it's good for or difficulty of build? I'm not sure what you're going for there. And I'd love to answer the question. I just don't know what you mean. I do have to say this is fun. I'm actually, even though I know I'm going a little slow here, this is well, it's hard with an audience. I'm nervous, man. Oh, I get it. Thanks, Alex, for the follow-up. So Alex says he did the build. He just wants to know if there are things people want to know. Yes, yeah, so that's a question for the, uh, for the community. Um, I do love the reviews. Uh, so those of you who have built uh, the mic parts kits, please post a review. The feedback really helps me. I love hearing what people have made with them. I love hearing if you had a question about the process, because I, like I said before, I incorporate that feedback into the manuals. Um, so that's really important. Okay. Anybody else? I think Charlie is uh, soldering XLR wires or maybe wiring the transformer in. I can't see either. I'm on the, uh, I'm on the XLR wires. Yeah, so in this kit, the, uh, the XLR insert is pre-wired. Um, so you really just need to solder, figure out which lead is which. The, the one mistake I was telling Charlie this before we started broadcasting. The one mistake I've heard from a T25 customer, um, he said, you know, I, I finished the build. I double checked everything. Of course, everyone always says that, <laughs> um, but it doesn't work. Uh, and I, I was dismayed because he was the first one. And I was, I didn't know if this is like a one-off or if like they were all going to fail. That's one of the things I lose sleep over is have I just sold a bunch of something that doesn't work? Um, and God knows we test them, right? But you never know. So, uh, so anyway, uh, he sent photos and the mistake that he'd made was that he had connected XLR one to either two or three. I don't forget which doesn't matter. Those of you who know how, how phantom power works, XLR one is ground and XLR two and three have power coming in and audio going out. Um, so if you connect one to either two or three, then the microphone's like, ah, I don't know. Cause my ground is gone and also half my power is gone. And also my signal is getting lost. Right. So it's, uh, total cluster for the mic Last if you cross one of those, mm -hmm. especially one. If you cross two and three, the mic works, but has reversed polarity from what you'd expect in, in most cases. Um, but, uh, uh, or at least in some cases, I, again, want to be, want to speak accurately. Um, 
the interesting thing about uh, Sheps, the Sheps circuit, is that it has two output signals, one on XLR2, one on XLR3, that are equal in amplitude but opposite polarity, which is freaky. Um, other mics, uh, um, actually, maybe they are all that way. If they're balanced, they should be that way. So uh, internal to the mic, the, the, this circuit doesn't play that way, but once it gets out, I guess it would be the same. But uh, um, anyway, yeah, so don't cross your XLR wires. But, uh, but yeah, so in terms of reviews, I, I'd love to see them, um, good or bad. Uh, it's good feedback, so uh, let me know what you think. Well, I mean, everybody's loving at least the, the Mini 47. Right on. You know, they use it for drums, for everything. If you can't make music with that microphone, you just can't make music. Now, can okay. I quote that? Huh? <laughs> can I quote that? Yes. That's awesome. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, let's get to the point. I'm not going to force everybody to sit here to the end of mine. I'll do another video after this with this mic on some stuff. Let's get to the good stuff. Because I know everybody has stuff to do. We're going to shake this up. Well, stir it up. Anybody got some Bob Marley they can play in the meantime? Stir <laughs> it up. While they're shaking, this is, uh, this is the finished mic. And I guarantee so that's you his the, looks better than mine. Circuit side. Well, see, all the solder joints are hidden, so you have no idea. <laughs> um, but you know what? I'm going to go off back. experience here, and my experience tells me you're better at this than I am. Okay. <laughs> well, all right. we are as stirred up as... Oh, oh hold on. I got one. I'm going to stir it up yeah, a little more. Should be I'm enough. not looking. I'm stirring like crazy. Should I need a Powerball machine. You know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We? All right, Ernesto. Big one. Draw. Drum roll. Right here. That's a terrible drum roll. David, 6101 of Baker. <laughs> yeah. David. David, you on the broadcast still? Let us know. Oh, that's right. Must be present to win, huh? Yep. He was actually one of the last ones to join. <laughs> oh, then he must. Be. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see. Let's see. I know we got about a third. The lag right now for YouTube pushing everything out is longer than it usually is. Yeah, it was probably over 10 because seconds. There's so many people. So let's see. Oh, check this so one. So David has been congratulated, but hasn't uh, stepped up, has he? Not yet. Oh. Do a refresh, see if he's there. Come on, David. If you're there, say I'm here. Come on, just just tap in the in the chat. I'm here. I'm here. He's like, this guy sucks at soldering. I'm out of here. I wouldn't blame him either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's here. David's here. All right. Well. Right on. Congrats, David. So, uh, David, send me uh, contact me via email. I'll need your uh, shipping address so we can get that kit out to you. Awesome. Well, this has been uh, quite quite a lot of fun. Holy moly. It's been nerve-wracking for me. <laughs> 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 you guys say it's been fun. <laughs> oh, that's what those are for. Oh, see, it's all making sense now. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, I have to say, too, building with an audience is challenging. So Charlie's been trying to listen, <laughs> and it, that makes it really hard to read. Um, the downside to these manuals is there's a lot of words in them. So yes. there's, th there's two reasons for that. One is that's my nature. I like to try to explain things. Um, no, video but, might be, but it's good. I mean, it's really good. It's good if people are willing to read, and not everyone is. And again, I'm not. that's not a judgment, but... Uh, I've just I've learned that that's true. Some people just aren't going to read, and so that's why I've started making videos. I think the book is still important, but anyway, uh, it's hard to read when you're listening to something or trying to have a conversation. So, uh, so Charlie's <laughs> been compromised, he, you know, in terms of the build. So I, um, I appreciate you coming to my defense. I do. <laughs> Thank you, Chris actually, Pemberton. It's uh, four in the morning in the UK. Thank you, man. You stayed this long. Oh, wow. Holy awesome. crap! You guys, I'm sorry I didn't get to talk to anybody so much today. But you're probably happy, actually, because usually, Matt, I'm the one, like, holy, it's like, blah, 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 blah. So they're probably like, finally, somebody else. 
Man, those are the warriors who stay at four in the morning watching this geeky stuff. It's awesome. All right, pull that in. Well, I know there's a couple things coming up, you guys. I will do a video with this since I'm will. I want to let Matt go. Don't want to have to make you suffer through more of this. And there's a video. Uh, I did a quick video with the SDC 84, which is just me playing some drums and giving you my thoughts on that mic. That's going to be coming out this week. I just need to finish the audio on it. And because that mic, like I said, ever since I still run two mics sometimes on the big setups, but I haven't been as much lately because I've been able to get a fantastic snare sound with just that microphone. Yeah. It's great. So that video, that'll be on demand video as well uh, coming out soon. But plus, if any of you guys tuned into the first broadcast once we kicked this whole thing off a few weeks ago again, that drum sound, that snare drum sound, is that microphone. And Tuesday's broadcast on the guitar broadcast, the drums that you heard, that snare sound is that microphone. Nothing else. So you're going to hear a lot of that microphone. <laughs> All right. Well. Hey, I got one last thing to say. Yes. Uh, for those who have held on this long, thank you for sticking it out with us. Um, I am going to, uh, I just thought of this, so I wasn't prepared in advance. I apologize for that. But I'm going to, if you look at the chat, I'm going to paste a discount code into the chat. Um, and uh, that's going to be good uh, for the next 48 hours or so, something like that. Oh, heck on yeah. the T25 kit. Hell so yeah. it'll knock 20, 25 bucks uh, off of the T25 kit. Um, so I just dropped that into the uh, chat. It's not active yet because I need to go eat dinner. But... Uh, I'll make that. That's uh, the U.S. size for Ultimate Studios, Inc. So uh, I'll make this code come alive later tonight. It'll be good for about two days. So if you're a new customer or want to check this out, um, please do. Matt, thank you. That is so cool. Appreciate that. Man, and I no appreciate worries. everything. I, I've had a blast these last couple of years, you know, getting to work with you and not only learning stuff from you, but using these, all your mics. It's just fantastic. Oh, well, thank and you. I that's appreciate you, you taking say. the time to... Uh, you know, do this with us and everything else. So very much appreciated. Right on. Thank you, sir. Thanks everyone for listening. Appreciate the comments. Appreciate the questions. Uh, if you have uh, questions for me, I'm easy to find via email. Um, hit me up via email and I'll do what I can. And if you have any questions for us, everybody hit the, you, or the Facebook group. The link is in the description. It's a private group for all of us. Everybody's been sharing their studios and what they're doing. Now go build some mics and share it there. So... All right, all right, you ready to sign off? I think we all need to eat. Yes. Matt's got to eat. We got to eat. And I'm going to finish this damn microphone. <laughs> <laughs> right on. I'm so all close. Right. All right, everybody. Thanks, Thank everybody. Thank you. All right. And where's our final? There it is.